My name is Harlan Beckett, and this happened to me back in 2011, out in the desolate Texas desert. I was an unusual kind of hunter then. Not after deer or boar, I was paid by the U.S. government to track down and neutralize things they didn't want the public to know about. Cryptids mostly. I've spent most of my adult life dealing with the things that go bump in the night. People vanish out in the woods, livestock turn up shredded, and the local sheriff blames a mountain lion or a rabid coyote. But sometimes they know the truth, or suspect it, and that's where we came in. This particular mission, though, had us scrambling at a faster pace than usual. There had been a string of disappearances over the past six months near a small town on the edge of the Big Bend National Park. Normally, we'd do weeks of surveillance and research before stepping foot anywhere near a suspected case. Information is a hunter's best weapon, even when your prey might not actually exist. This time, though, we were under orders from on high to bring a swift resolution to the matter. Something was spooking the higher-ups. Public attention was getting uncomfortable, so the five members of my team were dispatched in a hurry. Now, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a skeptic. Sure, I'd seen a few things that made me reconsider the limits of what's possible, but for every confirmed weirdness, there's ten cases that turn out to be misidentifications, hoaxes, or just plain old human evil. Still, the number of vanished hikers in this area was starting to defy even a cynic's disbelief. After a tense drive in our unmarked government van and a less than comfortable hike into the region, we set up camp at the edge of a dried-up creek bed. The desert was chilling at night, and I found myself wishing I'd packed an extra blanket. My teammates call signs. Hawk, bear, doc, and ace were as gruff a bunch of military vets as you could imagine. They grumbled about the cold, but years of training kicked in, and soon we had a small, covert camp with two shifts set for the nightly watch. I was on the first, hunkered down with bear, a six-and-a-half-foot wall of muscle and sarcasm. We sat in the quiet darkness, night-vision goggles making the barren landscape into a sickly green tableau. I'd always loved the desert, but out here, alone with just a radio crackling with the occasional chatter from the rest of the team, it felt downright oppressive. Hours passed without a hint of disturbance. It figured. Just as my mind started to wander, and I was contemplating a forbidden sip of coffee, Bear jolted. He raised his hand, the universal sign for, Hold! I strained my ears, trying to pick anything out of the usual desert night sounds. Then I heard it not so much a sound, but the absence of one. The crickets, those tireless fiddlers of the night, had suddenly fallen silent. Bear and I exchanged a look. Something was out there. We both flicked our weapons off safety. A minute stretched into an eternity— as we held our breath and waited for whatever it was to show itself. Then, from the crest of a dune a hundred yards away, a shadow emerged. Man-shaped, impossibly large. It moved with a jerky, inhuman gait, its arms too long, its head too bulky atop its shoulders. We were trained for this, but the sight was chilling. The night vision goggles made the creature's eyes glow with an eerie green light. It stared directly at us, and I could make out what looked like long, ragged gashes across its bare chest, almost like gills. Bear and I opened fire. The night erupted with the sound of gunfire as the creature let out a roar that sounded like a landslide. It didn't seem hurt, but it bolted back over the dune and out of sight. We pursued, scrambling up the sandy slope and down the other side. For a beast that size, it moved with unnatural speed, vanishing into the labyrinth of boulders and scrub at the base of the hill. Where the hell did it go? Bear grumbled. 
His bulky frame was surprisingly agile, but this was not our usual terrain. Radio Hawk, we've got contact. I spoke into my mic, requesting backup. A moment's silence, then Hawk's crisp voice acknowledging. We tracked the creature for what felt like hours. The rocky ground made it hard to follow footprints, and its smell and acrid, fishy scent wasn't strong enough to follow reliably. The sun began to rise, painting the landscape in a stark, unforgiving light. Sweat trickled down my brow, and my lungs burned. Suddenly, Ace came over the radio, voice filled with urgency. Harlan, bear, get out of there! I repeat, get dash. His words were cut off by a blood-curdling scream followed by a single gunshot. Ace! Bear shouted, fear and anger twisting his face. He fumbled with the radio as I tore back towards the direction we'd heard the scream. We sprinted up a narrow wash. I felt a surge of dread as I rounded a bend and saw a sight that turned my blood to ice. Doc was lying face down in the sand, utterly still. His back was a gruesome mess of crimson and torn flesh. Ace was nowhere to be seen. Rage and terror warred inside me. We'd hunted monsters, but I wasn't prepared for this. One of our own, savaged, and another missing. Whatever was out here, it was unlike anything we'd encountered before. Hawk! I barked into the radio. Doc's down. Ace is missing. We need extraction now. Hawk's voice was grim. Negative, Harlan. We're a click out, scrambling a chopper, but that's a fifteen-minute flight minimum. You and Bear hunker down and wait. Like hell. That thing dash. My protest died on my dry lips. Another roar echoed, this time from chillingly close. It was a challenge, a promise of violence. Bear grabbed my arm, his eyes filled with a desperation that mirrored my own. Come on, he growled. We gotta find cover. We sprinted for a jagged rock outcropping, a natural turret in the otherwise barren landscape. I clambered up behind him, my rifle shaking slightly in my hands. It was pathetically inadequate against what lurked out there. Below us, the desert stretched out, empty and desolate. The sun, now high in the sky, beat down mercilessly. It's circling us, Bear hissed, peering over the rock's edge, trying to flush us out. I knew he was right. This wasn't some animal attack. It was calculated, intelligent. This thing was hunting us, picking us off one by one. Guilt twisted in my gut. If I hadn't insisted on pursuing the creature, maybe Doc would be alive. Maybe Ace would be too. Bear squeezed my shoulder. Hey, cut that out. We all signed up for the job. It ain't your fault. It was a feeble attempt at comfort, and we both knew it. Time stretched into an eternity. Each rustle of the wind made us jump, rifles raised. We were out in the open, cornered. Thirst began to gnaw at my throat a cruel reminder of our vulnerability. Then, Hawk finally crackled over the radio. Harlan, choppers inbound. ETA two minutes. Get to the extraction point, double time. We needed a diversion. It was reckless, insane. It was our only chance. I looked at Bear. Gonna buy them some time, I said. A ghost of a grin flickered across his face. They paying us enough for this crap? He hefted a grenade, its metal casing glinting in the harsh sunlight. We clambered down, keeping low. My heart pounded in my ears as I darted through a boulder field, praying the creature would take the bait. It did. A bone-jarring roar sent me scrambling for cover as the thing charged its form a blur of speed and ferocity. Bear launched the grenade. It arced in a lazy curve, 
landing just behind the charging creature. The explosion ripped through the air, sending up a cloud of dust and shrapnel. Through the haze, I could see the damage a mangled leg, a chunk torn from its shoulder. It howled in rage but kept coming, limping but undeterred. Run, Harlan, run! Bear bellowed, firing his rifle at the thing to buy me precious seconds. I didn't look back. I sprinted like my life depended on it, and it did. I could hear the creature's ragged breath gaining on me, smell its putrid stench, feel its hot breath on my neck. My vision blurred. The world narrowed to the sandy path ahead, the frantic drumbeat of my pulse, and the looming shadow behind. I could make out the extraction point, a rocky plateau. The chopper hovered menacingly, rotors cutting through the tense air. Hawk leaned out, his weapon trained on the dunes. His eyes were wide, filled with horror. I wasn't sure if he was staring at me or my pursuer. With a final burst of adrenaline, I lunged forward, barely making it onto the chopper. They hauled me in just as the monstrous form burst from the dust cloud. A single shot echoed from Hawk's rifle. The creature staggered, then collapsed. I slumped back, staring at the receding desert, the horror of it all threatening to overwhelm me. The aftermath was a whirlwind of debriefings, medical checks, and psychological evaluations. I couldn't shake the image of Doc's lifeless body or the echoing scream that had marked Ace's end. We never recovered their remains. The creature we encountered was never formally identified. The incident was classified, as always. We were given medals and told to be proud. Some bureaucratic nonsense about protecting national security. But I knew those medals were stained red. They offered me another assignment, a chance to put my skills back in the service of my country. I turned them down. I've spent enough nights watching shadows. Some monsters, it turns out, aren't cryptids at all. They are born of cruelty and bureaucratic indifference. The weight of what we lost out there in the desert doesn't get any lighter. I left that team, left that life behind. I drive a cab now in a small town on the coast. Most fares don't look twice at the faded scars on my neck. Most days, I can almost pretend none of it ever happened. But some nights, when the fog rolls in off the ocean, I can still hear the crunch of desert sand beneath clawed feet and the echoing roar of a monster born from the shadows of mankind's making. My name is Jasper Thorne, and this happened to me back in 2006 out in the wilds of Montana. I'm a hunter, always have been. Not the kind that goes after elk. I work for the government, the branch you never see advertised. Tracking the things most people pray don't exist. Mothman sightings, whispers of werewolves, and missing campers that don't fit the usual. Mountain lion snack profile. That's the type of thing that gets us scrambling. Some things are explainable, some aren't. This particular job was nestled in the heart of a national forest, a chunk of land so vast the idea of disappearing into it would be almost comforting if it weren't for what was snatching people right out of their tents. The reports were a jumble of confusion and terror, half-eaten remains, shredded fishing gear, and glimpses of a hulking, fur-covered figure disappearing into the trees. Locals whispered about Bigfoot, and the news latched onto that like a leech, but that didn't add up. Those apes are gentle giants, or so they say. This thing, it was a predator. A team of five of us headed in, armed and prepared, as best we could be. There's no training manual for facing the unknown, just experience, honed instincts, and the grim realization that you'll probably be dealing with the aftermath, 
not the prevention, of the next tragedy. We'd been tracking signs of the creature for days, finding unsettling clues, trees clawed to ribbons, a half-chewed deer carcass the size of a bear, and monstrous footprints in the soft loam. My gut was in knots. This was wrong, all wrong. It found us on a night as black as spilled ink. The air crackled with tension as we huddled around a sputtering campfire, every shadow seeming to hold malicious intent. Our camp was quiet, no joking around tonight. Grayson, ever the optimist, tried to lighten the mood with a stupid bar story, but his voice trailed off in the face of our grim silence. Even he was rattled. The snapping of a twig broke the hush. We jerked upright, weapons raised, our night vision turning the forest into a sea of sickly green. A guttural growl came from the darkness, so deep it vibrated in our bones. Then, a figure stepped into the firelight, a towering, shambling form, easily eight feet tall. Covered in a patchwork hide of brown and gray fur, its eyes glinted with a cold, predatory light. A collective gasp went through our team. Christ Almighty, the thing was massive. Even the veteran hunters with me paled. This was no Sasquatch. It moved with deceptive speed for its size, lunging at Grayson who barely got off a single shot before the creature's clawed hand slammed into him. He flew backward, a sickening, wet crunch signaling that was the end for him. His limp body hit the ground, and a pool of crimson spread rapidly in the dirt. Terror and chaos erupted. The creature roared, a bone-chilling sound, and lunged again. We scattered, firing blindly into the night. The forest echoed with gunshots and terrified screams. Between the flashing muzzles and night vision distortion, it was hard to track where the creature was. Suddenly, I felt a burning pain in my arm. I cursed, clutching the wound and whirling around. The thing had circled behind me, its massive form a blur in the chaos. It raised its arm, claws dripping with blood, for the killing blow that would send me joining Grayson. And then, a different kind of roar sliced through the night. A searchlight swept over us, blinding me momentarily. The creature hesitated, then turned with a snarl and vanished back into the darkness. Extraction team! Hold your fire! A voice barked over a loudspeaker. Disoriented and shaking with adrenaline, I blinked into the harsh light. Helicopters hovered overhead, armed soldiers rappelling down. They moved with military precision, securing the area and quickly turning our scrappy little campsite into a war zone. My teammates gathered, shaken but alive. We were bandaged, debriefed, and whisked away at dawn. No sign of the creature remained, no trace of Grayson's body, just the lingering smell of blood and wet fur in the cold morning air. Months later, I can still hear the crunch of Grayson's bones breaking and the echo of his terrified scream. I'd seen things in this line of work, but nothing like that, that thing. It wasn't natural. It was a hunter, picking us off with chilling intelligence. The incident was swept under the rug, classified, another unexplained mystery for the conspiracy theorists to obsess over. We went our separate ways, shaken survivors of a nightmare in the woods. Some retired, haunted by what they saw, others pushed on, maybe looking for answers, or maybe just waiting for the next monster to cross their path. As for me, well, I left. Left the government hunters, the cryptid world behind me. I drive a delivery truck these days long-haul routes through small towns and backroads. Sometimes, in the dead of night, when the road ahead is nothing but the twin beams of my headlights, a prickle of unease runs down my spine. I'll glance at the tree lean, wondering if somewhere out there in the endless dark, a pair of glowing eyes are watching me, 
wondering how the prey escaped the trap that night. My name is Kieran Walker, and this happened to me back in 1999. I always loved the outdoors, so when the opportunity for a special assignment up in Alaska came around, I jumped on it. Tracking some weird sightings of a creature locals were starting to call. The rake. Something pale and scrawny that moved like nothing anyone had ever seen before. I figured it was a bear with mange. Or maybe some poor guy lost his mind and his clothes way out in the wilderness. Turns out, reality is a hell of a lot weirder than fiction. We were a small team. There was me, the experienced one, then Everett Hawk Hayes, the sniper, a big, quiet dude with a steady hand and a deadlier stare. Then there was Martinez, tech support, always buzzing with nervous energy and more than a little conspiracy theory chatter. Last was Davis, Doc, our medic and team skeptic, rolling his eyes at the superstitious locals and our whole mission more often than not. The Alaskan wilderness is something else, beautiful but brutal, a place that makes you feel like an ant in a giant's world. Days became a blur of following vague clues, deciphering half-chewed carcasses, and listening to spooky whispers from the few folks willing to talk about the rake. Locals kept their distances, muttering vague warnings and looking at our state-of-the-art gear with a mixture of pity and disbelief. Tension thrummed beneath the surface as the days dragged on with nothing to show. We made camp in a clearing by a choke little creek, the trees looming like prison bars in the fading twilight. I did my best to lighten the mood, cracking a stupid joke about the absurdity of our situation, but it fell flat. Everyone was on edge, except maybe Doc, who was lecturing Martinez about some internet hoax being the only rational explanation for our wild goose chase. That's when the first scream tore through the silence. I'll never forget that sound, raw terror cutting through the stillness snapping us to attention faster than any drill sergeant could manage. That scream choked off into a horrifying, gurgling silence. Davis! I shouted, already scrambling for my rifle. His tent stood empty, a flap torn open like a gaping wound. My gut twisted. Something was out there. We formed a ragged line, Hawk scanning the trees with his scope, me trying to track movement in the undergrowth, Martinez fumbling with his equipment. A heavy, wet stench washed over us, a sickening mix of rot and animal must that almost made me gag on my rising fear. A twig snapped behind us. I whipped around, my finger squeezing the trigger, but there was nothing there. Just the oppressive silence of the forest. Kieran! Martinez hissed, pulling at my arm. He pointed upwards, and my blood ran cold. There, crouched on a thick branch, was the source of the nightmare. It was tall, at least seven feet, its skin corpse pale, smooth, and stretched tight over bone. Its limbs were twisted, too long, and its hands ended in razor-sharp claws that dripped crimson in the moonlight. The thing had no hair, just those wide, pupilless eyes staring down at us with chilling hunger. Doc's theories of bears with mange crumbled away like dust. This was no animal I'd ever encountered. My shot rang out, echoing through the trees. The creature hissed, a chilling sound like steam escaping a rusty pipe. It bounded away into the woods with impossible agility vanishing into darkness faster than seemed possible. Martinez was shaking. Oh God, oh God, what the hell was that? I didn't answer. I was too busy trying to steady my own trembling hands and the acidic roil of fear in my gut. That wasn't a sick bear or some mutated animal. It was something different, something wrong. 
The old stories of monsters lurking under the bed suddenly didn't seem so ridiculous anymore. Hawk, you hit it! My voice sounded weak in the echoing silence. Hawk shook his head grimly. No clear shot, boss. That thing moves like grease lightning. We hunkered down, every rustle of leaves sending our nerves jangling. Morning brought only a grim kind of relief. No further sign of the creature, but Doc's tent remained a tattered, empty monument to the night's horror. We packed up without a word, a silent agreement to cut our losses. Whatever this thing was, it wasn't worth losing any more of our team. The extraction helicopter landed in a whirlwind of dry leaves and shouting soldiers. Back at base, they poked, prodded, debriefed, and interrogated us. Our story was met with hushed voices and sideways glances. We were sent home under the guise of routine leave, but I felt anything but routine. There was a new weight on my shoulders, a constant awareness of the shadows at the edge of my vision. My name is Kate Lawson, and this happened to me back in 2014, deep in the heart of Louisiana Swamp Country. Been doing this job hunting cryptids for the government my whole adult life. Mostly a lot of false alarms and wild goose chases, if I'm being honest. This time was different. This time, the thing hunting us was real. I always liked the swamps, that thick green tangle. The sense of something old and wild lurking just beneath the murky water. But this mission felt off from the start. Locals were calling in sightings of a creature they called the Rougarou, some kind of swamp werewolf. My gut told me it was nonsense, but hey, Uncle Sam signs the checks, so in we went. Our team was the standard mix, me, the seasoned vet, then there was Thompson, ex-military, all brawn and bad jokes to cover up the fact that the man was nervous as a rabbit. Michaels was our tech guy, quiet and brilliant. And rounding out the crew was Dr. Acosta, sharp, skeptical, and determined to debunk whatever beast we were supposedly dealing with. We set up camp by a stagnant bayou, mosquitoes thick as fog, the whole place dripping with humid heat. First few days were routine, tracking weird prints in the mud, recording odd noises on our equipment. It was almost fun, the way these missions usually went. There was a camaraderie in facing the unknown, a thrill in the hunt, even if it mostly turned up empty in the end. The shift came one moonless night, the air hanging heavy and still. We were huddled by a mess of wires and monitors that Michael swore were picking up something, but the rest of us heard just the buzzing of insects and our own restless shuffling. I was about to call it a night when a low growl echoed through the trees. We froze. That wasn't any animal I'd ever heard. It started low, an almost infrasonic rumble, then built into a guttural snarl that sent shivers down my spine. Michael swore, his fingers flying over the keyboard. Whatever it is, it's big, and it's close, he whispered. We scrambled for our weapons. I flicked on my night vision, transforming the swamp into an eerie green tableau of twisted roots and murky water. Something moved in the shadows, a flicker of motion that had Thompson swearing and firing his rifle blindly at the trees. The silence that followed was deafening. Hold your fire, I snapped. We don't want a Christ. A scream tore through the night, a high-pitched screech of terror that ended abruptly with a choking gurgle. It was Thompson. One second he was there, and the next he was gone, vanished into the darkness with shocking speed. We whipped around, guns raised, the night vision painting the world in that sickly green glow. Nothing. Panic clawed at my throat. I took a shaky breath, trying to think. 
Something was out there, something fast, silent, and deadly. Acosta, Michaels, back to camp. I barked. Double time. They didn't need telling twice. Our mad scramble back through the swamp was a blur of adrenaline and terror. When we stumbled into the ring of light around our campsite, I did a head count and felt my stomach drop. Michaels was missing. We holed up in his tent, breath ragged in our ears, listening to the symphony of swamp noises that now sounded mocking, predatory. Acosta was trying to reach base, but the signal was dead. I couldn't shake the image of Thompson, swallowed whole by the darkness. Kate, Acosta whispered, her eyes gleaming in the pale light. What the hell is out there? I shook my head, the cold truth seeping into my bones. I don't know, I admitted the words thick in my mouth. But I think we're not the hunters anymore. Dawn painted the sky a sickly pink, but brought no relief. Only confirmation of Michael's fate, his shredded clothes hanging from a tangle of branches, splattered in crimson. There was no point calling for backup now. Whatever we were dealing with was efficient, a hunter honed by the murky depths of the swamp. We were alone, outmatched, and marked as prey. We had one chance, a long shot— make it back to the extraction point five miles away through the heart of this creature's territory. We packed up what was left of our gear, a grim procession of two haunted, hunted survivors. I moved in front, rifle at the ready, trying to ignore the feeling of eyes boring into my back. Acosta was behind, scanning the trees with a desperate glint in her eyes. We didn't speak. The Swamplands, our usual playground, had turned into an alien battlefield. A twig snapped behind us. I whipped around, my finger squeezing the trigger, but there was nothing there. Just the oppressive silence of the swamp. Cade! Acosta hissed, pointing ahead. There, half shrouded by the mist rising off the water, was a silhouette. Too tall, limbs too long and hunched over like some twisted parody of a man. Its eyes burned red in the shadows. The Ruguru. It was real, and it was watching us. A surge of primal terror washed over me, stronger than anything I'd ever felt. This wasn't some mangy bear or hoax, this was the embodiment of a nightmare. My brain screamed at me to run, but my feet were rooted to the spot. The creature took a step forward, a low growl rumbling from its throat. My finger tightened on the trigger. This was it, either we took it down, or we'd end up another smear of red on the brackish water. Fire! I shouted, and the stillness shattered with the crack of gunfire. Acosta and I fired in unison, the sound echoing through the swamp. The creature let out a roar, not of pain but of pure fury. It charged, a blur of motion, leaping over the tangled roots with impossible speed. My training kicked in. I emptied the rest of my clip, aiming for the hulking form. It stumbled but didn't fall. Those bullets should have at least slowed it down, but the creature seemed barely wounded, just pissed off. Run! I yelled at Acosta, and I didn't have to tell her twice. We bolted, splashing through mud and shallow water, the roar of our pursuer gaining on us. We weren't going to outrun this thing. Desperation clawed at my sanity. I threw myself to the ground, rolling behind a thick cypress trunk just as the creature hurtled past, claws slashing uselessly at the ancient bark. It snarled, wheeling back, its red eyes blazing. Acosta wasn't so lucky. Her scream was cut short as the creature snatched her off the muddy path, her shouts dwindling into sickening crunches and wet, tearing noises. The world was a blur of rage and grief. I staggered to my feet, aimed my rifle, and unleashed every last round I had at the creature. 
I heard the thud of bullets hitting flesh, saw the beast falter, but still, it kept coming. I fumbled for a grenade, the pin falling from numb fingers. I pulled myself up onto the slick roots of the cypress, tossed the grenade in a clumsy arc, and braced myself. The explosion ripped through the humid air, showering me with dirt and swamp water. When the smoke cleared, the creature was gone. All that remained was a blood trail leading back into the depths of the swamp, an annoying, horrifying silence. Hours later, when the rescue helicopters finally whirred overhead, I was a hollow shell. The extraction team swarmed the area, eyes wide with a mix of disbelief and pity. They treated me with hushed tones and cautious looks, the ones reserved for a man on the brink of falling apart. The aftermath was the usual mess. Debriefings, evaluations, offers of counseling the government's feeble attempt at putting bandages on wounds that cut to the bone. Acosta and the others were labeled as tragic casualties, their names added to the long list of those lost fighting the unseen. The case was closed, classified, and buried in paperwork and bureaucratic jargon. I left, of course took my honorable discharge and walked away from the shadows, from the cryptids and the cover-ups. I tried to rebuild a life. Found a job as a park ranger out in Montana. Big sky country, as far from the swamps as I could get. Sometimes, at night, I can hear the crackle of gunfire in my dreams, followed by Acosta's scream. I'll jolt awake, heart pounding, sweat chilling on my skin. See the Ruger's blood-red eyes burning in the darkness outside my cabin window, and reach for a rifle that isn't there. See, the thing about monsters is that even when you survive, they never quite leave you alone. Some scars run deeper than flesh wounds, and mine fester in the shadows of my mind. I survived the Louisiana swamp, but a part of me will always remain in that murky water, with the echoes of screams and the stench of blood. I like to believe that thing is still out there, lurking in the uncharted depths, a grim testament to the horrors that hide beneath the surface of our world. Sometimes I think I hear reports whispered on the wind, missing hikers, mutilated cattle, strange sightings in the twilight. And a cold chill runs through me, a mix of fear and a strange, twisted longing. Because I'll tell you a secret that hunters like me learn the hard way. After you stare into the abyss, it stares back. Part of me will always be back in that swamp, crouched behind a cypress tree, waiting for a pair of burning red eyes to emerge from the mist. Waiting for a fight I know I won't win. My name is Riker Stone, and this happened to me back in 2008, way up in the remote wilderness of Alaska. Always been a hunter, and that line of work eventually led me to a certain discreet government branch dealing with critters most folks would call myths. Sasquatches, werewolves, skinwalkers, you name it, I'd probably tracked it or, if I was lucky, avoided it altogether. Alaska was a new kind of beast, though, a string of disappearances on the edge of Denali National Park, with gruesome half-eaten remains that didn't match any known predator. The team was the usual odd bunch, me, the no-nonsense veteran, Walsh, the tech was who should have stayed in his lab, and Dr. Ellis, a biologist with more degrees than sense, or so I thought at the time. We set up camp at the edge of the search area, a vast expanse of snow-capped mountains and dense pine forests that seemed to stretch on forever. The locals whispered about old legends, something about an evil spirit of the woods, but I chalked that up to superstition masking the fear that something out there was picking off their neighbors. The first few days were routine drudgery, analyzing the remains, setting up cameras, scouting the territory. 
Alaska has a way of making you feel small, insignificant, against the sheer scale of it all. A gnawing unease settled in the pit of my stomach, a feeling that we weren't the hunters this time, but the hunted. We were playing a game we didn't know the rules to, on an enemy's home turf. That feeling hit fever pitch one night halfway through the mission. I was on watch, hunkered by a crackling fire, when a piercing howl shredded the silence. It was like nothing I'd ever heard, a mix of wolf and something else, a guttural keen that seemed to echo off the mountains themselves. A chill ran through my veins, primal and cold, that had nothing to do with the sub-zero temperatures. I signaled Walsh, breaking the radio silence. Hear that? His voice came back, tight and strained, picking it up on the monitors. Whatever it is, it's massive. He patched in Dr. Ellis, who sounded breathless. Could be a new species, an apex predator evolved for this environment. Scientific wonder masking her fear, the usual arrogance of a textbook expert facing down the unknown. Then, the trees across the clearing exploded in a flurry of snow and shadow. A beast burst into view under the sickly light of the half-moon. It stood on two legs, easily ten feet tall, covered in fur the color of dirty snow. Its eyes, glinting a predatory yellow, fixed on us. The creature didn't resemble any known animal from the region but bore a sickening resemblance to the crude drawings found in native Alaskan lore, a twisted parody of both man and wolf. Dear God, Dr. Ellis whispered, the sound lost under the beast's snarl. Walsh swore, fumbling for his rifle. Permission to engage. Negative. I barked. Tranquilizers only. We need a live specimen. We were researchers, damn it, not a firing squad. Even in the face of this monstrous thing, protocol still held, a flimsy shield against the pounding terror in my chest. It charged, a blur of white claws like daggers tipped in black. Walsh got off a shot, finding its mark in the creature's shoulder. It roared not in pain, but in fury that sent a wave of dread washing over us. Dr. Ellis shrieked, and I turned to see the beast snatch her up. She thrashed in its grasp, her cries fading as the creature effortlessly retreated back into the tree line. The whole thing happened in a heart-stopping flash, a blur of blood and yellow eyes against the pristine snow. Silence fell, broken only by Walsh's ragged breaths and my own frantic thoughts. Protocol be damned the mission just went from research to rescue, if it wasn't already too late. We grabbed medical supplies and enough firepower to take down a tank, then plunged into the dark heart of the woods. The trail was surprisingly easy to follow, blood spattering the snow, and the occasional muffled echo of Ellis's terrified pleas. The creature wasn't trying to hide, more like it was toying with us drawing us deeper into its territory. The trees seemed to close in, shadows taking on sinister shapes, the snow crunching under our boots echoing too loudly in the oppressive silence. Finally, we stumbled into a clearing bathed in moonlight. There, amidst the skeletal trees, was the beast, hunched over what remained of Dr. Ellis. I raised my rifle, my finger trembling on the trigger. Walsh, I hiss, take its legs out, I'll go for a head shot. On my mark. Before I gave the command, the creature lifted its head. Its mouth, glistening with blood, stretched into an impossible grin. Then, in a voice not its own, a voice that echoed the broken sobs of Dr. Ellis, it spoke. You come play. The words were slurred, mangled infused with a horrifying glee. Walsh let out a strangled cry and fired wildly. I froze, rifle still aimed, my mind seizing up. The creature wasn't just some undiscovered predator. It was intelligent, 
sadistic. It had broken Dr. Ellis, turned her into some macabre mockery of herself. This wasn't a research mission. This was a trap. My hesitation cost us dearly. The creature lunged, not with the speed of a mere predator, but with an otherworldly swiftness that took us completely by surprise. A swipe of its claws sent Walsh sprawling, his rifle clattering uselessly away across the frozen ground. I fired, more out of desperation than strategy, the tranquilizer darts bouncing harmlessly off its thick fur. In a blink, it was on me. Bestial strength knocked my rifle aside and sent me sprawling into the snow. I scrabbled wildly for my backup pistol as the creature loomed overhead, pinning me beneath a paw the size of my torso. Each hot, fetid breath stank of blood and decay. I was face to face with true horror, the kind that stripped away all illusions of control, of man's dominance over nature. Then, just as suddenly as it attacked, the creature paused. It tilted its massive head, yellow eyes narrowing with a disturbing curiosity. I was less than an insect to this thing, a creature that could crush me in an instant. Yet it didn't, at least not yet. It was savoring the moment, drawing out the terror. No, I rasped, the word barely a plea. The creature opened its jaw in a parody of a smile and repeated, in Ellis' mangled voice, Play, play. A flicker of pity crossed its grotesque face, then it reared up, claws extended, ready for the killing blow. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a blur of movement. Walsh. His rifle was gone, but he was charging the monster with a hunting knife, a desperate, suicidal lunge. He yelled, an incoherent roar of rage and grief. The distraction saved my life. The creature twisted, its focus shifting to this new, puny threat. Walsh plunged the knife into its flank, a toothpick against a bear. But the creature roared with outrage and spun, backhanding Walsh with enough force to shatter trees. His body flew through the air, ragdolling into the unforgiving dark between the pines. I scrambled up, grabbing for my fallen pistol. Run! Walsh coughed, his voice laced with blood as he crumpled to the ground. Just run! Run where? It didn't matter. I wasn't leaving a man behind, not even one as foolhardy as Walsh. I leveled my pistol, more a gesture of defiance than a true threat, and fired every round at the creature's face. I might as well have been throwing pebbles. It advanced, slow and deliberate, savoring the hunt now. Then the radio on my belt crackled. A shaky voice broke through the static. It was base camp responding to our panic distress calls. Rescue was on its way, helicopters scrambling, but they wouldn't arrive in time. Hold on! I yelled into the radio, my voice barely above the creature's approaching snarl. Hold on, stay, damn it! Nothing. They'd cut the connection. Protocol. No point risking more lives for what was likely a lost cause. They were right, of course. The rational, logical thing, the professional thing was to retreat, regroup. I took one last look at the creature leering over Walsh's mangled body, then I turned and ran. Hours later, I stumbled back into base camp, half-frozen and haunted. They swarmed me, medics, soldiers, the grim-faced superior officers. Protocol kicked in once more sedation, debriefing, psychological evaluations. The machine was in motion, grinding up the ugly truth and spitting out a clean, digestible narrative. Unknown predator attack, tragic loss of personnel. The mission, of course, was classified, scrubbed from records. The aftermath is a blur colored by grief, guilt, and a burning rage I couldn't contain. 
They offered me the usual empty platitudes, more therapy, and honorable discharge if I wanted. I wanted a lot of things. I wanted Ellis and Walsh back. I wanted that monstrous thing dead. I wanted answers that nobody in any government facility could possibly give me. I left, of course. Took my meager severance pay and disappeared into backcountry obscurity. Worked at jobs, ranch hand, park maintenance, anything to keep me in remote places, as far from the civilized world as possible. I drifted, a ghost haunting the edges of the wild. There's gear in my truck, rifles, trank guns, more tech than Walsh ever dreamed of. Got it off the black market, favors called in from my old world. See, I don't sleep much, not without seeing Ella's shattered body or the flicker of yellow in the darkness. They think I'm broken, washed up, but they're wrong. One day, I'll go back to Alaska. I'll hunt that thing, or it'll hunt me. Doesn't matter. That clearing, beneath the cold Alaskan moon, is where this story ends. With the dead, or me. See, the thing about monsters, the thing they don't tell you in the reports and textbooks, is that once you've seen them, truly seen them, you can never look away. They become a part of you, a shadow that whispers in the night. I spent my life dealing with the things that go bump in the dark. Turns out, the biggest monster of all is the one you carry inside. My name is Harlan Wells, and this happened to me back in 2010 in the tangled backwoods of Louisiana. Always been outdoors, and when a government recruiter started sweet-talking me about a specialized wildlife research job, part of me figured I'd finally found a way to get paid for hunting. Turns out, the beasts I was tracking weren't anything you'd find in a field guide. This particular assignment landed me and my team in a swampy hellhole locals only whispered about. Supposedly, folks been going missing out there for decades, whole families vanishing without a trace. Rumors blamed it on everything from feral gators to Cajun werewolves. Truth is, the government suspected none of the above, which is where I came in. Team on this one was the usual mixed bag, me, the experienced tracker, Simmons, green as grass but sharp as a whip, Doc Hayes, grizzled biologist and resident skeptic, and Jackson, our comms expert and designated worrywart. We set up base camp in a rusted-out fishing shack that stank of mildew and moonshine, the swamp stretching out around us like a festering wound. Days bled into each other, a monotonous haze of mosquito bites, false leads, and enough humidity to make you sweat just thinking about moving. Locals were tight-lipped, casting wary glances our way and muttering vague warnings we were fools to ignore. City boy that I was back then, I chalked this up to rural superstition, a stubborn streak of defiance making me all the more determined to prove them wrong. The thing about real monsters is they don't play by your rules. They don't announce themselves with spooky howls or leave half-eaten corpses as clues. What happened next hit us sideways, an ambush in broad daylight. We were tracking some faint, inhuman-looking footprints when the world erupted in chaos. Simmons let out a scream that cut off in a sickening gurgle. One second he was there, and the next he was gone, yanked up into the tangle of branches with impossible speed. Doc swore, raising his rifle and firing blindly into the dense foliage, his normally cool demeanor shattering in the face of the unknown. Then it emerged from the greenery, a hulking brute of a creature, easily eight feet tall, built of bone, sinew, and an animalistic rage that radiated off it in waves. Its skin, leathery and mottled green, clung tight over twisted muscle. Its head was wolfish, all teeth and predatory eyes that gleamed with unnatural intelligence. 
Dear God, Doc breathed, lowering his rifle, his skepticism crumbling away as quickly as Simmons had been taken. The creature charged, a blur of claws and guttural snarls. We scattered, firing as we ran. Bullets seemed to barely slow the damn thing. My gut twisted with the terrifying certainty. This was no overgrown critter. This was something new, something that shouldn't exist yet stubbornly, horrifically did. We weren't facing any species science ever recorded, but a nightmare made flesh. Jackson tripped, his ankle twisting at an impossible angle, a scream bubbling in his throat. Doc, fool that he was, doubled back to help him. Run, you idiots! I yelled, but the creature was already upon them. The next few minutes were a blur of gunfire, guttural snarls, and Doc's panic yells cut short with chilling finality. Jackson, bless his broken leg, was scrambling away like his life depended on it, which, of course, it did. Blindly, I turned and ran, not out of tactical sense, but out of the sheer, gut-wrenching terror of a man facing a force nature never intended. Back at the shack, I fumbled for the radio, my hands shaking so badly I could barely operate the damn thing. My voice was a ragged sob when I finally spat out the situation report, a jumble of frantic pleas for backup that fell on deaf ears. The swamp, I could hear it rustling all around me, seemed to pulse with malicious awareness. By nightfall, the extraction team arrived, armed to the teeth and grim-faced. The look in their eyes was confirmation enough, no sign of Doc or Jackson, and what they did find of Simmons wasn't fit for burial. We went back the next day, more firepower than a small army. We combed that swamp, inch by bloody inch. Nothing. Whatever that creature was, it had vanished back into the primordial ooze it slithered out of, dragging my team with it. Aftermath? The standard mess, cover-ups, paperwork, the endless cycle of debriefing until your story became a well-worn script. They offered counseling, an early retirement package. Hell, they would have offered me a trip to the moon if they thought it would shut me up. Problem is, you can't unsee something like that. You can't rationalize away the blood and the bone, the flicker of those in human eyes. So I quit. Drifted north, found work where the air is cold and the world still feels somewhat sane. Took up odd jobs, bouncer, wilderness guide, anything that kept me out of cities. Even out here, on a particularly quiet night with the wind whispering through the pines, I swear I can hear a rustle in the underbrush, the muffled echo of Doc's scream, and the guttural snarl that followed. They say the best hunters sometimes become the hunted. I never wanted to believe it. Now, I spend my nights listening to the dark, rifle cleaned and loaded by the door. Because deep down, I know that someday, something will come for me out of the shadows, something born in the Louisiana swamp. And when it does, I'll be ready. My name is Thaddeus Thorne, and this happened to me back in 2006, up in the remote wilderness of the Cascades. I was a tracker back then, fresh out of the military and with a chip on my shoulder the size of Montana. They stuck me in a team with a bunch of government geeks for those. Unusual wildlife investigations. Bigfoot sightings, mostly. Pays the bills, I figured, and hey... I get to spend all my time in the woods. I had the arrogance of youth, the certainty that the world held no monsters a well-armed man couldn't handle. This case was pitched as a routine missing persons, a seasoned hiker vanished near a string of odd animal sightings. Locals said something stalked those woods, something big and unnatural. I rolled my eyes, prepping my gear with that city boy sneer I hadn't quite grown out of. 
Besides me on the team were Dr. Patel, biologist with nerves as thin as dental floss, Jackson, veteran soldier and stone-faced realist, and Walsh, radio guy with a nervous energy that set my teeth on edge. Base camp was a cramped trailer on the edge of a dense, old-growth forest, the kind that feels like it has secrets older than the country itself. Days started early and fell into a predictable rhythm, interviewing tight-lipped locals, scouring the forest floor, enduring Patel's endless theories punctuated by Walsh's jittery chatter. Nights, that's when the forest seemed to change, the silence becoming heavy, oppressive. Even Jackson, the unflappable one, looked haunted by the shadows. I chalked it up to nerves, the unsettling feeling of the unknown. Things went sideways during a routine sweep of the area where the hiker disappeared. We'd found some strange tracks, claws longer than any bear I'd ever seen. Then the forest erupted in a blur of sound and motion. Walsh screamed, the sound cut short with sickening abruptness. I spun, rifle raised, squinting into the gloom. A flash of fur, the gleam of eyes a guttural snarl that sent ice down my spine. There, half-shrouded in shadow, was the creature. It loomed at least seven feet tall, massive and hunched, its form a jarring mix of human and animal. It moved with a predator's grace, muscles rippling under coarse, mangy fur. Its eyes burned red in the dim light, filled with a chilling intelligence that turned my blood cold. Oh, God! Patel whimpered, his grip on his equipment case faltering. We scrambled backwards, firing blindly. Bullets seemed to vanish into that monstrous form without effect. It let forth a roar that shook the trees, a sound that wasn't bear or wolf or anything I recognized. The creature charged. Jackson, bless his old soldier heart, didn't run. He planted his feet and emptied his rifle into the beast, a desperate, defiant stand that bought us a few precious seconds. I heard the terrible sound of bones snapping, a brief scream, and then it was just the heavy, ragged breathing of the thing as it stood over what remained of Jackson. Bloodlust radiated off it in waves. Run! I shouted at Patel and Walsh, but they didn't need telling. They stumbled off into the trees, their terror-stricken cries fading into the distance. I knew the only logical thing was to follow them, but some idiotic part of me, a remnant of that stubborn defiance that had led me down this path in the first place, refused to retreat. I fumbled with trembling hands for another magazine. This was it. Me versus the monster. Me versus something out of a nightmare. I raised my rifle, aimed for those in human eyes, and squeezed the trigger. The roar of the gunshot echoed deafeningly through the trees. The creature flinched, a flicker of something like surprise flashing in its eyes. Then it let out another bone-chilling roar and took a step towards me. My gun clicked empty. Time seemed to slow down, each rustle of leaves, each ragged breath amplified to an unbearable pitch. I dropped the useless rifle and fumbled for my knife, the only weapon I had left. The creature advanced, a predator closing in on its prey. A flicker of movement above me caught my eye. Walsh had returned. Instead of running, he'd climbed a moss-covered old tree and was now perched precariously with his sniper rifle. He didn't hesitate, didn't cry out a warning, just focused with deadly precision and fired. The shot rang out with finality. The creature staggered, a guttural cry ripping from its throat. But it didn't go down. It whirled, eyes fixed on its new attacker. I knew, with dreadful certainty, that Walsh's life was measured in heartbeats. With a roar that vibrated in my bones— the creature lunged for the base of the tree. Walsh fired again and again, his frantic shots echoing like desperate hammer blows against the primeval rage of the monster. 
The trees shook with the force of the impact, leaves showering down like rain. Branches cracked and groaned. And all the while, the creature clawed its way upwards, drawing steadily closer to the terrified man above. I ran. Not because I was brave or thought I could help, but because something primal inside me demanded it. I couldn't leave a man to die like that. I reached the base of the tree just as the creature made its final lunge, teeth snapping and claws tearing into the ancient bark just inches from Walsh's dangling boots. In a blur of insane courage, I seized a fallen branch, thick and heavy as a baseball bat, and attacked. It was a puny human gesture against the raw power of the beast, but blind desperation can turn a man into a cornered animal. I charged yelling incoherent threats more to bolster my own flagging spirit than to intimidate the creature. It turned with a snarl, its red eyes blazing. I swung the branch with all my might, aiming for its head. The impact jarred my arms to the elbows, but the creature only stumbled back a step, a flicker of confusion in its monstrous eyes. Time distorted, my lungs burned, my muscles screamed in protest— I swung again and again, each blow echoing with desperation. Then, a miracle, Walsh got another clean shot off, hitting the creature in the shoulder. It bellowed in fury, a sound that made the ground tremble. That split-second distraction was all I needed. I brought the branch down on the creature's outstretched arm with the full force of my body behind it. The crack was sickeningly loud, not wood, but bone. A howl, part pain and part pure, unadulterated rage tore from the beast's throat. It stumbled, cradling its mangled arm, those chilling red eyes finally fixed on me with a terrifying clarity. For a heart-stopping moment, it seemed time itself paused. Then, the creature lunged, not with the feral grace of moments ago, but with the wounded animal's desperation. I dodged, more by luck than skill. The claws tore through the air where my chest had been a split second ago. I scrambled backwards, tripping and falling in the leaf-covered undergrowth, the fetid smell of decay rising in my nostrils. The creature loomed over me, breath hot and foul on my face. I raised the branch in a feeble defense, a child with a stick against a grizzly. A gunshot shattered the air, and the creature jerked, a spray of crimson across its face. It roared, a guttural, agonized sound, then turned with surprising speed, bounding away into the depths of the forest. Thad! Walsh yelled, scrambling down from the tree, his face pale. You all right? I couldn't speak. I sat in the damp leaves, my whole body trembling the broken branch still clutched in numb fingers. Patel, of all people, found us moments later. He descended upon me like a frantic mother hen, poking and prodding, clucking over the scrapes and bruises I hadn't even noticed. In the frantic rush back to camp, the adrenaline-fueled haze of what we just faced began to fade. Doubt crept in, the rational mind reasserting itself over the raw terror. Did, did that really happen? The aftermath was a blur of debriefings, medical checks, and carefully worded reports. The official story boiled down to a tragic accident. The hiker lost, Jackson killed by a wild animal, and brave government agents scaring off a grizzly that got too close for comfort. The mangled branch I had fought with vanished into evidence lockup, never to be seen again. They offered therapy, hush money, everything in their playbook to make this go away. I wanted to scream, to rage against the tidy narrative they were spinning, the neat way they filed the unimaginable into a dusty cabinet. But the truth was, no one would have believed us. There was no proof, just the memory of those red eyes and the echo of Jackson's scream. I thought about Patel, shaking like a leaf, about Walsh, his face etched with haunted determination. 
We shared a look that didn't need words, a silent brotherhood of those who had glimpsed the darkness and lived to tell the half-believed tale. I quit the job a few weeks later, cashed out that hush money, and bought myself a remote cabin tucked away deep in those same mountains. They say some scars don't heal, just become a part of who you are. Up here, alone with the wind in the trees and the shadows that deepen a little too quickly at dusk, I'm starting to think they might be right. I keep a rifle loaded, salt shells for good measure, and sleep with a hunting knife under my pillow. Some nights, a rustling at the edge of the clearing wakes me, a flash of red in the moonlight. Is it just a deer startled from its grazing, or something else, something biding its time? My heart races, my hands clench, and I remember the weight of that branch and the sickening snap of bone. They think we hunt monsters. Sometimes I think the monsters hunt us, drawn to the darkness they recognize. See, the thing about staring into the abyss is, sometimes, it stares back. And even out here, with miles separating me from civilization, I know deep down, I am never truly alone. There are things in these woods older and more terrible than we can comprehend, creatures of nightmare made flesh. The government, the world, they can turn a blind eye, dismiss our story as delusion or trauma-induced hallucinations. But I know what I saw. I know what's out there, waiting in the shadows. And someday, something with red eyes and a predator's snarl will come for me again. When it does, I'll be ready. My name is Jack Carver, and this happened to me on October 23, 1999. I still remember it like it was yesterday. You see, I don't work your average 9 to 5. No spreadsheets or water cooler gossip for me. I'm part of a specialized unit, a unit most people think only exists in bad horror movies. We hunt the things that go bump in the night, the creatures hidden in the shadows of myth and whispered rumors. The call came in late. A string of disappearances up in the Pacific Northwest, centered around a sprawling stretch of old-growth forest. Hikers going missing, search and rescue teams finding nothing but scraps of half-eaten trail mix. Locals started whispering about Bigfoot, but that never sat right with me. There's a scent to those big fellas, a musk that lingers for days after they've moved on. This had a different stink to it cold, metallic, like the air right before a lightning storm. I shipped out with my team, Williams, a grizzled veteran with more confirmed kills under his belt than any of us, and Thompson, a bright-eyed rookie fresh out of the academy and itching to prove herself. We landed in a logging town on the edge of the forest, the kind of place where everyone knows your name, and a stranger turning up raises eyebrows. We flashed some fake badges, said we were with fish and wildlife, and hunkered down in a seedy motel to plan our first sweep. The terrain was brutal. Thick, ancient trees blocked out the sunlight. The forest floor was a tangled carpet of moss and ferns, every fallen log a potential hiding place. We moved slow, scanning every inch of our surroundings for any sign of our quarry. It felt like the woods themselves were watching us, holding their breath. By the third day, we still hadn't found anything resembling a trail. The locals were right about one thing, whatever was out there was smart. It left no tracks, no scat, no broken branches. The tension nodded us. Williams was getting twitchy, Thompson was starting to doubt herself, and even I was beginning to wonder if we were chasing shadows. Then came the break. A flicker of movement in the undergrowth, a flash of something, wrong. It moved too fast to be an animal, too upright for a bear. We gave chase, adrenaline pumping through our veins. The trees thinned, 
giving way to a rocky clearing? That's when we saw it. It was tall, at least seven feet at the shoulder, with skin a mottled gray-green, stretched tight over bulging muscles. Its head was long and narrow, its eyes black pits that reflected no light. But it was the arms that made my blood run cold. They were too long, tipped with sickle-like claws that gleamed in the filtered sunlight. The creature didn't roar or charge. It just tilted its head, studying us with a chilling intelligence. Something about those eyes. They weren't just animal eyes. There was a cunning in them, a calculating coldness that set my teeth on edge. Williams was the first to act. He raised his rifle, the sharp crack of the shot echoing through the trees. The creature jerked, a spray of inky black blood staining the rocks behind it. But it didn't go down. Instead, it turned towards us, and a scream tore from its throat, a high-pitched, keening wail that sent shivers down my spine. It was moving, a blur of gray and claws, impossibly fast. Thompson didn't stand a chance. One swipe of its claws and she was down, her scream cut brutally short. Williams and I opened fire. Our bullets found their mark, peppering the creature with holes. Thick black blood splattered the ground, the metallic tang of it hanging heavy in the air. The creature staggered, roared, not in pain, but in rage. Then it whirled, vanishing back into the trees with unnerving speed. The forest fell silent, but the echo of that horrible scream still hung in my ears. We found Thompson where she had fallen. What the creature left behind was barely recognizable. My stomach churned, and I fought the urge to vomit. Williams didn't say a word. He just looked at me, his face etched with a grim determination. I saw the same reflection in his eyes as I felt in my own gut. This was far from over. We patched ourselves up, radioed for backup, then set to tracking the creature. The blood trail was easy to follow at first, but then it petered out, like the thing had simply melted back into the forest. The arrival of backup was less reassuring than I'd hoped. More grunts and camo gear, the same wide-eyed confusion we'd all worn a few days ago. Command set up a perimeter, containment protocols ringing in my ears like a bad joke. Contain what, exactly? A whirlwind with teeth. Williams vanished into the command tent, leaving me to babysit the newbies. He emerged an hour later, face drawn. We got orders, he said, his voice low. They want us to lure it in. The plan was insane, as most plans involving monsters tend to be. I'd be the bait. It took every ounce of my willpower not to argue, to yell about Thompson and how we were outmatched. But some battles aren't won with shouting. That night I lay in the center of the clearing, rifle in my sweating hands, heart pounding against my ribs. The forest was alive with whispers and rustles, every shadow holding the potential for those black, unblinking eyes. It came not with a charge, but materialized from the darkness like a conjuring trick. One moment the clearing was empty, the next, it stood there, studying me. Moonlight glinted off its claws. I squeezed the trigger, the gunfire shattering the forest silence. The creature flinched, a spray of black blood, but then it was moving. Too damn fast. My shots went wild as I scrambled back, scrabbling for my sidearm. Then Williams was there, his rifle spitting fire, the creature finally roaring in true pain. Branches snapped, the ground trembled as it thrashed and twisted, wounded but far from dead. Backup converged, flashlights slicing through the night, more bullets tearing into the creature. It twisted not towards us, but deeper into the trees. It moved with a desperation that sent a chill through me. Was it retreating, or leading us somewhere? 
The command truck was a fortress of flashing lights. Medics swarmed what was left of the creature, strapping it to a gurney, shouting technical terms I didn't understand. Its ragged breaths echoed in the night, a horrible, wheezing counterpoint to the organized chaos. Williams stood near the rear of the truck, his expression unreadable. You did good, Carver, he said, offering me a hand. Relief warred with unease, a sour taste in my mouth. A flicker of movement in the open truck doors. Not the creature, but something small, huddled in the shadows. It looked like a child, thin limbs wrapped tightly around itself, staring out with those same, dead black eyes. My voice failed me before I could speak, a strangled gasp caught in my throat. William's grip tightened. Don't, he warned, but the order was unnecessary. We both knew. There wasn't anything we underscore could underscore do. The truck doors slammed shut. Engines roared, and like that they were gone, the government-sanctioned monster truck leaving only the tang of blood and exhaust in the cold forest air. The aftermath was a whirlwind of paperwork and debriefings. Euphemisms like asset containment and national security risks were thrown around while I tried to scrub the image of that small, terrified figure from my mind. Thompson's face floated before me as I filled out reports with hands that still shook. Officially, the forest incident was blamed on a bear attack. Hikers were warned, trails were closed, the world moved on as it always does. But Williams and I, we knew. We'd seen the truth behind the carefully papered over lies, monsters are real, the government knows, and sometimes the people who get called in to handle things, the ones with badges and guns and brave faces, they don't make it out with their humanity intact. They offered me a promotion, a cushy desk job away from the front lines. I turned it down, told them I'd rather be out in the field facing what might be lurking in the darkness head-on. Because the truth is scarier than any monster I've hunted. There are things the government can contain, and then there are things they unleash. And sleep doesn't come easy when you don't know which kind is waiting for you out there in the shadows. My name is Alex Thorne, and this happened to me on July 7, 2008. I'm not ashamed to admit I was a small-town boy with big city dreams, fresh out of the academy and raring to prove I could handle whatever the world threw my way. Little did I know, the world was about to throw something at me straight out of a nightmare. See, I'm not a regular cop. I'm part of a specialized department the kind that gets hush-hush calls about things no one else is meant to know about. Things like the string of missing persons cases plaguing the Olympic National Forest up in Washington State. Hikers disappearing, trails ending in patches of trampled underbrush, and the odd, lingering smell of copper. Some folks whispered bear attacks, others Bigfoot. We knew better. They flew in my partner, Agent Michaels, a woman with eyes as hard as flint and a smile rarer than a unicorn sighting, and me, the wide-eyed newbie. We hunkered down in a forest service cabin, maps spread out on the chip table, trying to make sense of the nonsensical. No pattern to the disappearances, Michaels muttered, dragging a thumb across the map. Men, women, experienced hikers, weekend strollers, poof, gone. She flicked a look at me. You got any bright ideas, Thorn? Ideas? All I had was the gnawing feeling in my gut that this wasn't some animal attack. I grew up in those woods. I know the way a predator moves, the way it leaves its mark. This felt different. A call crackled over the radio the next morning. A group of college kids reported a strange noise deep in the forest something like a scream cut short. 
we geared up, adrenaline spiking. This was it, our chance to find out what was lurking out there. The forest felt oppressive that day, the sunlight barely filtering through the canopy of ancient trees. The college kids led us to the spot, all wide eyes and jittery gestures. The air hung heavy with that same metallic tang, a taste like fear at the back of my throat. Michaels motioned us forward, her pistol drawn. We moved in a tight formation, scanning the undergrowth for any sign of our quarry. Then I saw it, a flicker of movement behind a moss-covered log, the flash of something inhumanely pale. Hold your fire! Michaels hissed, but it was too late. The college kids panicked, their shouts echoing through the trees. And then it was there. It rose from behind the log, a monstrous figure at least nine feet tall. Its skin was a sickly gray, stretched tight over bulging muscle. Its head was long and narrow, dominated by two pits where its eyes should have been, pits that reflected no light, only an endless, consuming darkness. And the smell, it was like a slaughterhouse, hot blood and something fouler underneath. The creature roared, a sound that ripped through the forest and rattled the bones in my chest. It moved with a speed that defied its size, a blur of claws and teeth. One of the college kids, a girl with bright pink hair, screamed as the creature lunged for her. Michaels fired, the bullets pinging harmlessly off its leathery hide. The creature backhanded her, sending her sprawling into a tree with a sickening crack. And then it was on me. I fired my pistol, more out of instinct than hope. The creature screeched, spattering me with inky black blood. Then its claws were raking down my chest, tearing through my protective vest like tissue paper. Pain exploded in my side, white-hot and blinding. I stumbled backward, fumbling for my backup weapon as the creature loomed over me. Those dead, black eyes fixed on mine, and I swear there was a terrible intelligence in them, a hunger that went beyond mere instinct. The world spun, the trees tilting at a crazy angle. I managed to squeeze off one last desperate shot. The impact knocked the creature back, a surprise grunt rumbling from its throat. But it wasn't enough. It stalked forward, claws outstretched, and I knew, with a bone-deep certainty, that these were my last moments. Then a different sound cut through the clearing, the heavy thud of a larger caliber rifle. The creature jerked, another inky spray of blood, and whirled, searching for the source of the attack. Michaels was back on her feet, miraculously, a scoped rifle braced against her shoulder. She wasn't aiming at the creature, but at something above it. Her next shot echoed, and then the impossible happened. A massive tree branch, high in the canopy, snapped with a deafening crack hurtling down towards the creature. It barely had time to register the danger before the branch impaled it, pinning it to the ground with the force of a freight train. The creature roared, thrashing, the impact shaking the whole forest floor. Michaels and I scrambled to put distance between us and the thrashing behemoth. The college kids, forgotten in the chaos, were frozen in shock. It took Michael shouting at them to break their trance, and then we were running, stumbling back towards the trailhead. The creature didn't follow. Its thrashing slowed, then subsided into ragged, bubbling breaths. By the time we reached the waiting vehicles, those breaths too had fallen silent. The aftermath was a blur of debriefings, medical tests, and cover stories. Hiker found dead, bear attack, the usual lies to keep the world safely ignorant. Michaels and I ended up in a nondescript hospital room, stitches patching us together. They'll want to study it, she said, nodding towards the distant tree line, her voice flat. Isolate its DNA, see if they can weaponize whatever makes those things so damn hard to kill. 
I shivered, despite the hospital blanket. We'd seen the truth behind the curtain, a truth the suits and scientists back in their comfortable offices were eager to exploit. Something about that felt more monstrous than the creature itself. My injuries healed faster than expected. The doctors called it luck. I chalked it up to stubbornness. Michaels and I received commendations, a pat on the back, and orders to ship out for our next assignment. Life for the pawns in the government's monster-hunting game rolled on as relentless as ever. But the memory of those empty black eyes stayed with me. I started seeing them in the shadows, behind reflective surfaces, always watching, always judging. The smell of copper lingered in my nostrils, a phantom reminder of my own near-death. Sleep became a battlefield, the creature's roar echoing through my dreams. One morning, I walked into my commanding officer's office, resignation letter in hand. He raised an eyebrow, a flicker of disapproval crossing his face. "'Thought you were tougher than that, Thorn,' he said, disapproval heavy in his voice. I forced myself to meet his gaze. "'Guess I found out different, sir.' I set the letter on his desk. Some battles you just don't come back from. He didn't try to stop me as I walked out. Some things even the government can't contain, and a man haunted by monsters is no use to them. The drive home was long, the open road stretching before me like a path back to sanity. Or at least something close to it. I'd heard somewhere that the trauma you carry shapes you. I wasn't sure what shape I'd take, scarred and raw, but I knew one thing for certain. My days of hunting monsters were over. The regular world felt thin, fragile after what I'd seen. The worries of normal folks seemed petty and distant. I got a job in construction, the simple, repetitive labor grounding me in a way the constant adrenaline of my former life never had. People drifted in and out, co-workers, bar buddies, the occasional short-lived romance. None of them really knew me. How could they? I held the monster-shaped hole in my life close, guarded it fiercely. Nights are still the hardest. The creature sometimes returns in nightmares, but they're fading, its roar less deafening. Mostly I dream of Michaels, standing tall with her rifle, of the thud of that falling branch of the second chance I don't deserve but desperately cling to. Because the truth is, some monsters you can fight, some wounds you can heal. But there are others, the ones that burrow deep inside you, that become a part of who you are. And those, those you simply learn to live alongside. My name is Jack Carver, and this happened to me on October 6, 1993. I worked a 9-to-5 at the time, sold insurance door-to-door. -door. It wasn't glamorous, but hey, a man's gotta eat. So yeah, about as far from Monster Hunter as you can get, but life has a funny way of throwing curveballs. This whole mess started with a missing persons case. Small town tucked in the foothills of the Cascades, the kind of place where everyone knew your name and what you had for breakfast. Only this guy, old Tommy Whitaker, wasn't just gone, he was vanished. Left his truck parked by his favorite fishing hole, half-smoked cigarettes still in the ashtray. Folks figured bear attack, accident, maybe he just skipped town. But something about it prickled the hairs on the back of my neck. See, I grew up in those woods. Hunted, fished, got lost more times than I care to admit. And I knew there weren't bears around Whitaker's spot big enough to take a man without leaving so much as a boot behind. Cops humored me, did a cursory search, found nothing. Case went cold. Except, it wasn't cold for me. I couldn't shake the feeling I'd missed something. So, 
I did what any reasonable insurance salesman with an irrational hunch would do. I started my own investigation. Weekends, I'd hike out to Whitaker's spot. Took samples from the disturbed ground, studied maps, talked to anyone who'd listen, which turned out to be pretty much no one. Folks were starting to give me the side eye, muttering about Crazy Jack. Can't say I blamed them. Then came the second disappearance. A woman this time went for her afternoon jog along a well-used trail, dog trotting at her heels. Dog showed up back home that evening alone, whimpering and skittish. Search parties found nothing but some torn-up clothing and a hell of a lot of questions. That's when the suits rolled into town. FBI, or some alphabet soup agency nobody'd ever heard of. They took over the investigation, quarantined the area, standard hush-hush government stuff. My first thought was to lay low. Maybe they had a handle on things. But that nagging feeling was back, an insistent itch I couldn't ignore. One night, I found myself sneaking past the barricades and into the restricted zone. I know, I know, not the brightest move. But sometimes, curiosity outweighs common sense. The forest felt wrong. Not just the oppressive silence, the lack of animal noises but a shift in the air, like a storm about to break. I pressed on, drawn deeper by something I couldn't name. The trees thinned, giving way to an open clearing. And there, in the center, bathed in the cold light of the moon, was the source of that wrongness. It was a creature, no, that doesn't do it justice. A thing, all twisted limbs and gleaming black eyes. Its skin wasn't fur or hide. It looked like woven bark, shifting and rippling as it moved. The size of it, a good two heads taller than me, and broad as an ox. It was hunched over something in the grass. Even from a distance I could make out the shape of a body, limp and unnaturally twisted. A surge of nausea and rage hit me. Whitaker? The woman? Then the creature lifted its head. Those empty black eyes locked with mine, and a bone-deep chill went through me. It wasn't animal intelligence I saw there, but something calculating, something old and malign. That's when it moved. Not with the explosive speed of a predator, but with an awful, unnatural fluidity. It rose on spindly legs that looked too frail to support it, unfolding like a nightmare insect. One gnarled hand, tipped with claws like obsidian shards, reached out towards me. I turned and ran. I didn't think, just reacted. Branches tore at my clothes, the ground blurred beneath my pounding feet. The creature didn't roar or bellow. It made a sound like dry leaves rustling in a cold wind, a sound that seemed to seep into my bones. Stumbled out of the tree line and onto a paved road, lungs burning and legs shaking. A car was approaching, headlights cutting through the gloom. I waved frantically, a desperate figure bathed in sweat and moonlight. The car screeched to a halt, and a middle-aged couple peered out at me, faces a mix of alarm and confusion. I don't remember what I said, something incoherent about needing help, needing to get to the police. They didn't question it, just bundled me into the back seat and drove. The police station was a blur of fluorescent lights and skeptical stares. My story came out in a disjointed rush the creature, the disappearances, the thing in the woods. The local cops exchanged looks, the pity mingled with the small-town crackpot judgment. And then the suits arrived. Black sedans, crisp uniforms, eyes that revealed absolutely nothing. They took me out back, into a waiting helicopter, and the world tilted again. The next few days were strange. Nondescript rooms, medical tests, endless questions delivered in flat, monotone voices. They didn't ask if I saw something, they asked what I saw, 
analyzing my descriptions with the detached curiosity of scientists dissecting a new species. Somewhere in there, the story shifted. The search for the missing was abandoned, the perimeter around the clearing expanded. It was no longer a rescue operation, it was containment. They told me a sanitized version of the truth, the creature, whatever it was, wasn't unique. The government had files on similar sightings, sporadic, scattered across the country for decades. They needed my help, they said. Needed me to be bait. I laughed then. A hollow, broken sound. Me, an insurance salesman, against the stuff of nightmares? But they wore me down promises of protection, veiled threats of what might happen if I refused. That sliver of stubbornness in me, the part that would have let go of a hunch about a missing old man, twisted into a perverse sort of heroism. The plan, as far as I understood it, was as insane as the situation itself. They'd outfit me with trackers, night vision gear, enough firepower to level a small army. I was to return to the clearing, draw the creature out, and, well, survive long enough for their team to swoop in. The night they dropped me back into those woods, the air tasted of copper and fear. The tactical gear hung heavy on me, an absurd costume for an absurd play. They were watching, I knew. Hidden in the trees, drones buzzing overhead, their control room a world away waiting for the show to start. I reached the clearing. It was the same, yet utterly transformed. The space where I'd first glimpsed the monster was tainted, the ground scarred by the imprint of its inhuman form. Something shifted in the shadows, and I raised my rifle, the night vision turning the world a sickly green. There it was, hunkered by the body of its latest victim. It turned its head towards me, a slow, deliberate motion. In the night vision's glow, those empty eyes shone like twin, radioactive moons. I fired. The clearing erupted in gunfire and unnatural screeches. I stumbled back, vaguely aware of more shouts ringing out, not mine, larger caliber. The creature twisted, its bark-like skin rippling as bullets tore through it, but it didn't fall. Then it was moving, its blurring form barely visible even through the night vision. My shots went wild as I scrambled backwards, towards the tree line. One clawed hand swiped at me, tearing my rifle from my grip and sending me sprawling. I fumbled for my sidearm, a pathetic defense against this ancient, implacable horror. Pain exploded in my shoulder as the creature's claws raked across me. I screamed, the sound lost in the chaos of the clearing. The creature loomed over me, its breath a fetid gust of decay. Those eyes, merciless, filled with an intelligence keen enough to savor my terror. This was it, dumb luck and stubbornness finally run out. Then a blinding flash filled the clearing. A roar, not from the creature, but something mechanical, man-made. The creature jerked, its screech turning into a bubbling gurgle, and then it was falling, collapsing in on itself like a dying star. The aftermath is a jumbled mess. Helicopter lights, men in hazmat suits swarming the clearing, the stench of ozone and something fouler hanging heavy in the air. Medics patched me up, the shock numbing the pain. I should have been dead. I was dead, for all intents and purposes, until whatever they hit that monster with brought it down. They sequestered me again, different facility, different questions. Not about the creature this time, but about the weapon, about what I saw. It was experimental, they said classified. They were tight-lipped on whether it worked, whether the creature was truly gone. I left with a new name, a hefty severance package, and the feeling of being a pawn moved off the board. The small town at the foot of the Cascades faded in my rearview mirror, the missing person posters weathering on telephone poles. Life, supposedly, 
went on. I got a mundane apartment, a mind-numbing desk job, a therapist who specializes in PTSD. Nightmares still wake me in a cold sweat, the creature's claws inches from my face. There's a tightness in my chest that never goes away, a constant hum of adrenaline waiting for the next monster to step out of the shadows. My name is Walker James, and this happened to me on July 22, 2011. Up until then, I figured government hush-hush stuff was mostly conspiracy theory nonsense. You know, little green men and flying saucers. Turns out, the truth is a hell of a lot scarier. Now, I'm not a city slicker. I grew up in the Montana wilderness, the son of a game warden. I know my way around the backcountry, can track an elk blindfolded, and handle a rifle like an extension of myself. Which is probably why they recruited me. They didn't come out and say, Monsters are real. Hell, they barely said anything at all. Just a couple of men in crisp suits offering me a job that paid too well for the vague description. I wasn't an idiot. I knew it wasn't going to be tracking poachers or relocating problem bears. But I figured, what did I have to lose? I was young, restless, and a damn good shot. Training was a whirlwind of remote locations, weird medical tests, and the kind of firepower that would make any gun nut squeal with delight. They broke us down, built us back up, taught us to operate as a unit. My team was an odd mix. Jensen, ex-military, nerves of steel, Morales, hotshot tech genius, and me, the country boy. Our first real mission was in the Appalachians' rugged, thick woods, and more legends about things lurking in the shadows than you could shake a stick at. Folks were disappearing, turning up dead if they were found at all. Word on the official channels was animal attacks but the locals whispered about old gods and curses. We set up camp in an abandoned ranger station. Place had a heavy feeling to it, the kind that prickles the hairs on the back of your neck. At night, the forest seemed to press in, the silence broken only by strange rustling sounds that were too big to be any critter I recognized. The intel was frustratingly thin. Whatever we were hunting was smart— left no tracks, no scat, nothing solid to work with. Days bled into nights of tense patrols and waiting for something, anything, to happen. Jensen swore he saw something big and shadowy moving at the edge of the firelight, but Morales dismissed it as nerves playing tricks. Then came the night that changed everything. We were deep in the back country, miles from the nearest road. The moon was a sliver in the sky, the forest cloaked in a darkness that felt absolute. And that's when we heard it. A howl. But it wasn't the howl of a wolf or a coyote. This was long and mournful, echoing through the trees with a chilling, bone-deep resonance that seemed to vibrate through the earth. The hair stood up on my arms. Jensen and Morales exchanged grim looks. We knew. Whatever was out there, this was it. We followed the sound, moving with cautious precision. The forest floor was a tangle of roots and dead leaves, each snap and rustle seeming deafening in the unnatural stillness. The smell hit me first, a thick, musty odor like old blood and rotting meat. Then I saw it. The creature was crouched in a clearing, its back to us. Even in the dim moonlight, I could see it was massive, at least ten feet tall at the shoulder. Its skin was dark and hairless, rippling with unnatural muscle. The head, that's what stuck with me. Long and tapered, with a jaw full of jagged, yellowed teeth that gleamed even in the faint light. But the worst part was the eyes, narrow slits, glowing with a cold, malevolent light. 
Morales let out a strangled gasp. The creature whipped around. It didn't snarl or roar, just opened its maw in a silent scream, a chilling promise of the violence to come. We opened fire. The creature jerked, a spray of inky black blood staining the leaves. It stumbled, but kept coming, a blur of claws and teeth and pure rage. Jensen was the first to go down. The creature swatted him aside like a fly, sending him crashing into a tree. I heard the cracking of his ribs, his choke scream. Morales was fumbling with something, a high-tech grenade of some sort. He swore, tossing it at the creature's feet. The explosion lit up the night, and for a heart-stopping second, I thought we had it. The creature was thrown back, its skin smoking. But it wasn't dead. It shook itself, a snarl finally ripping from its throat, and lunged at Morales. He screamed, a short, sharp cry cut brutally short. I was alone. Panic surged through me, hot and blinding. Training kicked in, load, aim, fire. I emptied my magazine, the gunfire echoing like thunder in the silent forest. The creature flinched with each hit, its movements slowing, but it didn't fall. Blindly, I fumbled for a reload, but I knew in my gut that bullets weren't going to stop this, this thing. It was closing in, crimson eyes fixed on me. I could smell its foul breath, see the glistening saliva dripping from its fangs. Then the forest erupted in sound and light. Flash bangs detonated, blinding white flares momentarily illuminating the clearing. Backup had arrived. Voices shouted orders, gunfire rattled, heavier caliber than ours. The creature screeched, clawing at its eyes, disoriented by the sudden onslaught. I scrambled back, legs burning, expecting the creature to tear through our backup team like tissue paper. It thrashed, a mountain of muscle and rage, but the flash bangs had done their job. It couldn't focus, its blind charges taking it crashing through the trees. Then, a new weapon joined the fray. A net not made of rope or wire, but crackling with raw energy, shot out from the darkness and slammed into the creature. It howled, its thrashing growing sluggish, the energy net sparking and sizzling against its skin. That bought them, bought us, time. Two figures materialized from the shadows, wielding truck-mounted floodlights. They blasted the creature with an intense beam, making it recoil, its skin blistering where the light touched it. It roared in fury and pain, but it was trapped, the net constricting, the light forcing it back towards the center of the clearing. The men with the floodlights moved in, flanking it. Tranquilizers, now! Someone barked, their voice hoarse with tension. I saw syringes the size of small rockets fired from specialized rifles. They thudded into the creature's hide, and at last, its movements began to falter. It sank to its knees, then collapsed onto its side, its breath coming in ragged, bubbling gasps. It still wasn't dead, but it was finally down. The aftermath was a whirlwind. More suited figures swarmed the clearing, their movements efficient and practiced. They secured the creature, wrapping it in chains and some heavy-duty tarp. Medics converged on Jensen he was alive barely, but it was going to be touch and go. Someone clapped a hand on my shoulder. Good work, Walker, a gruff voice said. It was one of the men who brought down the creature, older, grizzled, with eyes that had seen too much. I opened my mouth to reply, but the words wouldn't come. My hands were shaking, and there was a sour tang of bile in the back of my throat. Morales' mangled body flashed through my mind, the memory of his terrified screams echoing in my ears. The grizzled man seemed to understand. It gets easier, he said, his voice surprisingly gentle. 
Or maybe you just get harder. He didn't wait for a reply, just turned and walked away. They choppered us out the next morning. Back at base, it was the usual mix of debriefings and thinly veiled threats to compartmentalize the experience. The official story, they said, would be a rogue bear, maybe rabid. Just another routine animal attack for the newspapers. Jensen pulled through, after months of surgeries and rehab. But he wasn't the same. The spark in his eyes was gone, replaced by a haunted darkness. Sometimes, at night, I could hear him screaming. They offered me a promotion, a permanent spot on the front lines. Part of me, the part fueled by rage and guilt, and the need to make damn sure nothing like this ever happened again, wanted to say yes. But as I stood there, staring at the stark white walls of the base infirmary, smelling the antiseptic tang that would forever be intertwined with the scent of blood and cordite, I couldn't do it. I turned in my resignation. They didn't try to change my mind. They never do. It's a one-way ticket, that life. You see too much, become something too dark, and eventually, one of two things happens, either a monster ends your story, or you walk away, a damaged echo of the person you used to be. I moved back to Montana, to a tiny cabin even further off the grid than where I grew up took a job with the Forest Service Routine Trail Maintenance, Wildlife Surveys, the kind of stuff where the scariest thing I encounter is a grumpy moose. Life is quiet, simple. Sometimes that simplicity feels like a betrayal to Jensen, to Morales, to all the other faces I can't forget. But at night, when the wind whispers through the pines, and the shadows stretch long and strange, I know I made the right choice. Because the truth is, some battles can't be won. Some monsters lurk in the deepest, darkest corners of the world, and some reside in your own soul. And after seeing both up close, well, let's just say I'm happy tending to my little patch of wilderness, keeping an eye out for the ordinary threats. The extraordinary ones, they can wait for someone else. My name is Eli Sutton, and this happened to me on February 27, 2009. Back then, I was just a small-town boy with a love for the outdoors and a healthy dose of skepticism about all those Bigfoot sightings folks whispered about. Now? Well, let's just say I don't scoff at campfire stories anymore. See, I'm part of a specialized unit. Call us cryptid hunters, monster control. Doesn't really matter. Truth is, there's things out there that most people only see in nightmares. And it's our job to deal with them. This particular assignment took us out to the Olympic Peninsula rugged, heavily forested, the perfect place for things to hide. Reports trickled in, strange noises deep in the woods, livestock disappearing, the odd, half-eaten carcass turning up miles from where it should be. Standard cryptid M.O. My partner, Davis, was an old hand. Ex-military, eyes sharp as flint. I was the rookie, eager to prove myself but still green enough to get spooked at every snapping twig. We set up base camp in an abandoned logging outpost, the scent of sawdust and pine resin thick in the air. Days turned into a routine of patrols, tracking phantom trails, and interviewing locals who swore they saw something massive moving through the trees. Frustration gnawed at me. Maybe they were just spooked, maybe even lying for attention. Part of me wanted to pack it in, admit this was a wild goose chase. Then came the call that changed everything. A hiker, a young woman out for a weekend trek, was reported missing. Search and rescue teams were scrambling, but we knew the drill. By the time they found her, it was bad enough with the animals, but this. 
I still see her face in my nightmares sometimes. Davis and I geared up, the forest looming around us like a dark green wall. The search grid led us deep into old-growth territory, the tangled underbrush and towering trees making it feel claustrophobic, oppressive. We found her, or what was left of her, in a small clearing. The scene was indescribable. The violence of it, the sheer wrongness, twisted my gut. Davis swore, a low, harsh sound. There? I managed to ask, but my voice sounded small and scared even to my own ears. Never seen a bear do this, Davis muttered, his gaze sweeping the clearing. He was right. This wasn't a natural kill. No animal tore limbs with such precision, left such unnatural marks. And the smell, it clung to the air, a coppery tang laced with something rotten and foul. I gagged, my hands trembling on my rifle. Then we heard it, a rustling from the tree line, heavy and deliberate. Davis and I exchanged a look, his face grim. We moved back to back, rifles raised, scanning the shadows. And then it stepped out from behind the massive trunk of a cedar. It was tall, at least nine feet, built like a linebacker with too many limbs. Its skin was leathery gray, stretched tight over bulging muscles. The head was long and narrow, and when it opened its maw in a silent snarl, I saw rows of jagged, blood-stained teeth. But it was the eyes that got me. Empty pits, reflecting no light. Those eyes didn't hold any animal rage. They held calculation, a chilling intelligence that sent a shiver down my spine. What the hell is that thing? I whispered, my voice barely above a breath. Davis didn't answer. He just raised his rifle and fired. The creature jerked, a spray of inky black blood spattering the leaves. It roared then, a bone-rattling sound that vibrated through the clearing, and charged. We unloaded our rifles into it. The bullets tore into its hide, but seemed to do little more than annoy it. The creature stumbled then righted itself, its roar echoing through the trees. Davis swore again, a desperate note creeping into his voice. Backup ain't gonna get here in time, he yelled over the din. We gotta draw it off. We ran. Blindly, branches whipping our faces, the creature's enraged bellows close behind us. I could feel its fetid breath on the back of my neck, the ground rumbling with each of its monstrous strides. A shot rang out different caliber than ours. The creature shrieked, and I dared a glance back. Davis was down, his leg twisted at an impossible angle, the creature looming over him. Time seemed to slow. Rage and terror spiked in my blood. Davis, mentor and friend, was about to die because of that, that thing. Unacceptable. I turned and charged. Probably stupid probably suicidal. Didn't care. I leveled my rifle, aimed for those empty eyes, and squeezed the trigger. The recoil slammed into my shoulder, and the creature staggered back, a bubbling snarl ripping from its throat. Davis yelled something, a desperate warning lost in the chaos. But I was beyond listening, beyond rational thought. My world narrowed down to the creature, to the blood splatter on its gnarled skin, to Davis lying helpless on the forest floor. I kept firing, emptying the magazine in a desperate frenzy. The creature thrashed, its movements slowing, its roars taking on a ragged edge. Then it twitched, and went still, its massive form crashing to the earth, sending up a cloud of dirt and dead leaves. Silence descended, broken only by my harsh panting and the thudding of my own heart. I didn't move, didn't dare believe it was over. But the creature didn't rise again. I stumbled towards Davis, rifle hanging forgotten from my numb fingers. He was alive, barely, 
his face pale and slick with sweat. His leg was a mangled mess, bone jutting at a sickening angle. You crazy son of a... He coughed, then winced. Even in pain, Davis found a way to cuss me out. Shut up, I said, my voice rough. Relief warred with the lingering adrenaline rush. Focus on staying awake. I ripped strips from my shirt, fashioned a makeshift tourniquet. The wound was nasty, bleeding slowing but not stopping. He needed evac and fast. The radio crackled to life. Back up. Voices barked questions, our status, our location. I relayed the situation, trying to keep my voice steady, trying to ignore the way Davis hissed in pain through clenched teeth. Then came the part I'd been dreading. Hold position, Sutton. A new voice on the radio, crisp and authoritative. Extraction team is inbound, but you have a new primary objective. Containment and observe. Over. Containment? I echoed, disbelief lacing my tone. That thing is down, negative, Sutton. The voice cut in. Primary target is not dead. I repeat, not dead. Your team stumbled on something big. It's priority now. Over. Something big. My stomach clenched. What the hell did they know that we didn't? The forest around us felt suddenly hostile, teeming with unseen watchers. The creature's corpse, a monstrous testament to this new reality loomed in the clearing. There would be others, they were saying. Maybe different, maybe worse. Something twisted deep in my gut. The backup team arrived in a whirlwind of shouts and tactical gear. Medics swarmed Davis, loading him onto a stretcher. Black SUVs screeched to a halt, and men in crisp suits I vaguely recognized fanned out, securing a perimeter. Sutton, one of the suits approached me, expression unreadable. You did good. Damn good. But your work isn't done yet. He gestured towards the creature's body. They want you to be the point man on this. You up for it? I looked at Davis, his face drawn as they loaded him into a helicopter. Then I looked at the creature, the chilling emptiness of its eyes boring into me. A fresh wave of anger surged through me, hot and potent. Hell yeah, I'm up for it, I said, the words raspy in my throat. It's time somebody started hunting back. The aftermath was a whirlwind of debriefings and medical exams. Davis lost his leg. It was a hard blow. He was a good man, the best damn partner I could ask for, and this whole mess felt squarely on my shoulders. But he was alive, and he had that stubborn glint back in his eye. He'd make it through, even if things would never be the same. Then came the offer. The suits were impressed. They saw my recklessness as courage, the blind fury as determination. They wanted me for their bigger game, the real monster hunters, the ones who saw the true depths of the darkness. I hesitated. Part of me wanted to walk away, find an ordinary life where the worst monsters were the ones in the news, not in the backwoods. But the other part, the part fueled by rage and a burning need for answers, it craved the fight, craved the chance to tear down whatever was behind the curtain. In the end, the choice wasn't really mine. I saw the missing persons posters tacked up in the station— the faces of people vanished into the shadows. I saw the creature's carcass strapped to a flatbed, its dead eyes somehow even more menacing than when alive. I saw Davis in his hospital bed, a haunted look in his eyes, a silent plea for someone to keep up the fight he couldn't anymore. I joined the unit. They shipped me out to some clandestine base, taught me new tactics, new weapons— gave me a glimpse of a hidden world where the lines between myth and nightmare blurred beyond recognition. My new life isn't easy. 
It's filled with blood, lies, and the constant, looming threat of creatures ripped straight from horror stories. I've seen things that would shatter the minds of ordinary men, done things I'm not proud of. But I sleep better at night knowing I'm on the front line, holding back the darkness. Maybe it's a fool's errand, a war that can't be won. Maybe one day, I'll end up like the scraps of clothing and bone littering remote forests, another victim of the unseen world. But until then, I'll keep fighting. Because if we don't, who will? My name is Rowan Carter, and this happened to me on October 12th. 1997. I was a park ranger back then, fresh out of the academy, posted to Olympic National Forest in Washington State. Bigfoot country, if you believe the stories, but I always figured those sightings were more likely fueled by bad moonshine than actual monsters. Turns out, I was about to be proven dead wrong. Before all hell broke loose, it was honestly the perfect job. Hiking, patrolling the backcountry, the kind of peace and quiet a city boy like me didn't even know existed. My partner, old-timer named Granger, was the stereotypical gruff mountain man, but had a heart of gold under the prickly exterior. We got the call about the missing campers on a Tuesday. Group of college kids, dumb, reckless, and ill-prepared, ventured off trail and hadn't been heard from since. Routine stuff, sadly. Probably got turned around, maybe a twisted ankle. We'd find them in a day or two, cold and sheepish. That's what I told myself, anyway. We started our search in the general area of their last known coordinates. Olympic is massive, old-growth forest so dense the sunlight barely filters through gives the whole place an eerie primeval feel, especially as the afternoon shadows started to lengthen. That's when we found the first traces of them a shredded backpack, scraps of torn clothing snagged on a branch, streaks of dried blood on the leaves. Granger swore under his breath, his face grim. That ain't no bear attack, he muttered. My stomach did a slow, sickening flip. Something about the scene felt wrong, unnatural. The blood spatters were too high. The torn fabric had puncture marks I couldn't explain. And everywhere, that smell, coppery and rotten, clinging to the air. We followed the trail, if you could call it that. It was like something big and clumsy had thrashed through the underbrush, leaving a path of trampled ferns and snapped branches. As the sun began to dip below the tree lean, Granger called a halt, insisted we make camp and continue in the morning. I didn't argue. The forest had eyes on it by then, an oppressive feeling of being watched, hunted. Sleep was fitful, my dreams filled with rustling noises and the gleam of unseen eyes in the darkness. Dawn came as a relief. We packed up quickly, rifles loaded, nerves taut as bowstrings. The trail grew fresher, broken saplings, deep gouges in the earth, and more blood. And then we found the clearing. Or what used to be a clearing. Now it was a slaughterhouse. Three tents lay in tatters, their contents strewn about like a morbid scavenger hunt. Sleeping bags were ripped open, their stuffing hanging from the trees streaked with crimson. And in the center of it all, the bodies. What was left of them, at least? Two of the campers, a guy and a girl, were barely recognizable. Parts were missing, limbs torn away with grotesque violence. The third body, another girl, was hanging upside down from a tree branch, her throat ripped open. I vomited, the meager contents of my breakfast burning my throat. Granger just stood there, his face like granite. Then he raised his rifle and walked deeper into the clearing, 
following a fresh set of inhumanely large footprints. I hesitated, my instincts screaming at me to run, but some twisted sense of duty compelled me to follow. We stalked our quarry for what felt like hours. The forest floor was a mess of crushed vegetation and those massive footprints. The smell of blood and rot grew stronger with each step. And then we saw it. It was standing on the edge of a ravine, its back to us. Even hunched slightly, it dwarfed Granger, who was a solid six foot two. Its skin was leathery gray, stretched tight over bulging muscles. The head was long and narrow, and when it turned to look over its shoulder, I saw the eyes. Black, empty pits reflecting the dull light. A chill went through me that had nothing to do with the mountain air. This wasn't some undiscovered ape species. This was something, older, elemental, a piece of the nightmare world bleeding into our own. Granger raised his rifle, took aim. I was too stunned to move, even as I realized the sheer stupidity of what he was about to do. One shot against that, thing, it was suicide. He squeezed the trigger. The rifle barked, echoing through the trees. The creature jolted, let out a roar that shook the leaves from the branches. Black blood spattered where the bullet had hit, and it whirled, its speed blurring. Granger got off one more shot before the creature was on him. It swatted aside his rifle like a toy, then its claws raked across Granger's chest, flinging him backward. He landed in a tangle of limbs, his scream echoing in the sudden silence. Time seemed to slow. Instinct, that primal urge for survival, took over. I raised my own rifle, a desperate, foolish gesture. The creature stalked toward Granger, who thrashed weakly on the ground, his shirt a spreading stain of red. I fired, emptying the magazine in a frenzy of noise and fear. The creature flinched with each hit, its roar morphing into something like a pained snarl. Thick, black blood splattered the ground, but it didn't fall. It turned toward me, its empty eyes locking onto mine. I knew then, with absolute certainty, that I was next. Blindly, I fumbled for a reload. My hands shook, the spare magazines clattering against the damp earth. The creature stalked closer, a predator savoring its cornered prey. Granger let out a strangled cry, the sound abruptly cutting off with a sickening, wet gurgle. His body lay still, twisted at a grotesque angle. My trembling fingers finally found a fresh magazine. I slammed it home, racking the bolt. The creature was mere yards away now, its stench overwhelming. I raised my rifle, aimed for the center of its massive chest, and squeezed the trigger. Nothing. Click. Empty chamber. Terror washed over me, an icy wave that left me paralyzed. The creature roared, a triumphant, bloodthirsty sound. It lunged. Then something slammed into its side with the force of a freight train. The creature staggered its momentum carrying it crashing into a massive redwood. The impact shook the whole forest floor. It scrambled to its feet, a confused snarl rumbling in its throat. I blinked, disoriented. A truck, military issue, painted in dull camouflage, had appeared out of nowhere, partially concealed by the thick underbrush. Its side door hung open, and a man leaned out, a weapon in his hands that looked like something straight out of a sci-fi movie. He fired. Not bullets, but some kind of crackling energy beam that struck the creature in the chest. It howled, and blistering smoke curled where the beam made contact. The creature thrashed, swatting at the air like it was fighting an unseen enemy. The man fired again. And again. The creature stumbled its movements slowing. Then, with a final tortured roar, it collapsed to the ground, its massive form trembling, then going still. 
Silence descended, broken only by the rasp of my own breathing. The man jumped out of the truck, two more figures following close behind. They moved with a practiced, efficient sort of urgency, securing the area with practiced ease. One of them, a woman with steely eyes, approached me. Rowan Carter? she asked, her voice crisp and authoritative. I nodded, unable to form words. We need you to come with us, she said. There was no question in her tone. They brought us to a nondescript compound deep in the woods, Granger's body strapped to a gurney, my own wounds hastily bandaged. The place thrummed with a subdued energy, armed personnel moving in and out of bunker-like buildings. The debriefing was a blur. I stumbled through my account, my voice raw. They asked about the creature, its appearance, its behavior. I described what I saw, the questions blurring together until my head pounded with exhaustion. We've been tracking that thing for months, someone said, an edge of frustration in his voice. Lost good people to it. Another person, older, with a gaze that seemed to bore right through me, spoke then. You did well, Carter. Survived an encounter most don't. There was something like grim admiration in his voice. They offered explanations, or half-truths at least. Cryptids weren't myths, they said. Remnants of a wilder time, creatures that slipped through the cracks of mainstream science. The government knew, had a task force dedicated to containing them. I was a recruit now, whether I liked it or not. Granger didn't make it. Death certificate listed a wild animal attack to keep his family from agonizing over the gruesome truth. I went to the funeral, stood in the crisp fall air and lied about the bear that took my friend. In the weeks that followed, they patched me up and put me through the ringer. Drills, tactical training, weapons I'd never imagined. Each night, I closed my eyes and saw the creature, Granger's lifeless stare, the smell of blood and rot clinging to my skin. Part of me wanted to run, to find some semblance of a normal life. But another part, a cold and vengeful part, craved the chance to hunt those that lurk in the shadows, to make damn sure that what happened in that forest never happened again. The day came when they loaded me back into a truck, a new team at my side. Different mission, different creature, same terror lurking deep in the pit of my stomach. They handed me a rifle, the weight of it both familiar and impossibly foreign. Welcome to the front lines, Carter, someone said, his mouth stretching into a smile that didn't reach his eyes. I didn't smile back. Out there, somewhere in the vast wilderness, the monsters waited. And whether I was ready or not, the hunt was on. My name is Declan Knox, and this happened to me on July 23, 2019. Born and raised in Tennessee, woodsman by blood. Now, well, now I hunt things you won't find in any wildlife guide. Things most folks would swear are campfire stories, if we weren't under strict orders to keep our mouths shut. This particular hunt took us to the Appalachian backwoods, rugged, mist-shrouded mountains where folks still vanish without a trace. Locals whispered tales about old mountain spirits, the kind that demand a blood tide for safe passage. We rolled our eyes, checked our gear, night vision, thermal imaging, enough firepower to take down a grizzly. Our intel was thin. A string of disappearances, some cattle mutilations, and blurry trail cam footage of something big and unidentifiable. Standard cryptid mystery, with the added complication of agitated locals who were ready to take the hunt into their own hands. Days bled into nights. Mountain air has a stillness to it, a heavy sort of silence that gets under your skin. 
We heard rustling in the bushes, the snapping of twigs, deer, probably, or some overzealous raccoon. But it was enough to keep you on edge, that prickling feeling down the back of your neck that means you're not alone. Reynolds was the first to go. A big man, ex-marine, the type who scoffed at ghost stories around the campfire then slept with a shotgun. Snatched from his sleeping bag in the dead of night, vanished without a sound, without a trace of struggle. We searched the campsite until dawn, found nothing but some trampled ferns and that heavy, expectant silence. The tension ratcheted up a notch. We moved in pairs, backs to backs, scanning the dense foliage. The mountains watched us, impassive and ancient. My partner, Hayes, started twitching with every rustle in the leaves, chain-smoking to calm his nerves. I didn't blame him. Losing Reynolds like that, it made the shadows feel a hell of a lot deeper. Then, the trap. It wasn't cunning, but it was brutally effective. A tripwire, well hidden, that sent one of our ATVs tumbling down a ravine. Driver broke his leg, and when we rushed to help, that's when we saw it. The creature stepped out from behind a stand of twisted pines. At least eight feet tall, built like a linebacker gone feral. Its skin was a mottled gray, tough as old leather, stretched tight over bulging muscles. The head... I still struggled to find the words. Long, tapered, with a lipless mouth that stretched into a grotesque parody of a grin. And the eyes, flat, black, reflecting back the moonlight like a demon's twin stares. We opened fire. The creature roared in fury and pain, a sound that rattled the leaves and echoed through the valley. It moved in a blur, dodging our bullets with unnatural ease. Hayes screamed, a short, strangled cry followed by the wet sound of tearing flesh. I turned, saw Hayes doubled over, the creature sinking its claws into his back. My training kicked in, aim, fire, squeezed the trigger until the gunfire drowns out the screams. The creature twitched, jerked, then released Hayes, his body a ragdoll tossed aside. It fixed its gaze on me. Bloodless dripping from its crooked grin. I backed away, unloading my rifle into its chest. Black blood splattered the ground, but the wound seemed to seal over just as quickly. The creature stalked closer, a relentless predator, my clumsy retreat no match for its raw speed. Then a voice cut through the night, sharp as a gunshot. Knox! Get clear! A flash of light, the stench of ozone, and a crackling beam lanced out from the treeling. The creature shrieked, blistering smoke rising from where the beam struck it. I scrambled out of the line of fire, heart pounding in my ears. Men surged from the trees, armed with strange weapons that glowed and hummed. The creature thrashed, snarling and snapping, but the beams pinned it in place, forcing it back. It roared in frustration, lunged, then slumped to the ground, its unnatural energy finally spent. I stood there, panting, the forest buzzing with the aftermath of near death. The men moved like a well-oiled machine, securing the creature, bagging evidence, calling in a chopper for evac. It felt eerily familiar, the practiced efficiency of covering up the impossible. One of the men, short and wiry with the eyes of a man who'd seen too much, approached me. Special Agent Thorne, he said, extending a hand. You handled yourself well under fire. Just doing my job. I managed, my voice still rough. Thorne gave me a half-smile. Well, Knox, your job description just got a hell of a lot more complicated. Welcome to the real world. A flurry of activity followed. Black vans, unmarked helicopters, and the hurried dismantling of a mobile command post that seemed to vanish as quickly as it had appeared. Hay's body was loaded onto a stretcher, a sheet masking the gruesome work of the creature. 
They told me he didn't suffer. Small comfort after seeing the terror in his eyes. Thorn offered me the deal of a lifetime, or maybe a curse, depending on how you looked at it. A chance to go deeper into the rabbit hole, to become part of the shadow war waged against things that go bump in the night. A chance to find some kind of meaning in Reynolds' disappearance and Hay's bloody end. Part of me yearned for my old, uncomplicated life. Fending off black bears and drunken campers seemed like a vacation compared to this. But something else burned within me. Anger. A thirst for answers. The knowledge that if I walked away, these creatures remained out there, praying and killing. In the end I said yes. The onboarding was a bewildering whirlwind. Medical evaluations that bordered on invasive, psych tests that asked questions about things I tried not to think about, and an oath of secrecy so binding, it felt like signing my soul away. The new me got a shiny badge, clearance levels that made my head spin, and a one-way ticket to a grim world existing on the fringes of reality. Training was brutal and humbling, not just weapons and tactics— but the deep dive into cryptozoology, the blurry intersection of myth and monstrous fact. I learned things that eroded my sanity, things that should have shattered my understanding of the natural world. They told me about the classification system, apex predators lurking in the Amazonian depths, winged horrors that haunted high-altitude ruins, shape-shifting parasites hidden in plain sight. The creature I saw in the Appalachians? A bottom feeder in this hidden ecosystem, powerful but crude. There were worse things out there. My team changed too. No more green recruits or hardened rangers. Now my partners were ex-military spec ops veterans, men and women with haunted eyes and hard-won skills. We operated in an underworld of unmarked planes and remote outposts striking at shadows, engaging in firefights that never made the news. Days stretched into sleepless weeks, then into a blur of missions and close calls. Each victory was tinged with the cost, good people lost, cryptic threats neutralized, and a creeping sense that the darkness was far vaster than we could hope to contain. I carried the memories of Reynolds and haze like weights dragging at my soul. One mission in particular still claws at my dreams. A hunt for a lake serpent in the Alaskan wilds, a creature entwined with native legends. We won, in a sense, drove the thing back into the murky depths, saved countless potential victims. But the price. Johnson took a harpoon-like barb through the chest protecting me, his dying grin more heartbreaking than any monster's snarl. Nights hold a special terror for me now. The adrenaline rush fades, leaving behind the gnawing question, how long until my luck runs out? How long until I become another name etched on the memorial wall at some clandestine government facility, another casualty in a war that the world must never know exists? Is this how it ends? Traded one wilderness for another— the Appalachian woods for this hidden battleground where sunlight rarely reaches. Hunted and hunter locked in an unending dance and my humanity chipping away, one nightmare at a time? I used to think ignorance was bliss. Now I'm not so sure. Maybe there are worse fates than being devoured by a cryptid. Maybe the real monster is the knowledge that they exist, the constant, looming threat— the sacrifices demanded to keep the rest of the world slumbering in the comfortable lie of a monster-free existence. But then again, morning always comes. The gear gets checked, the mission files opened, and we ready ourselves once more. Because there's nobody else. If we don't stand on the front lines, who will? My name is Elias Holt, and this happened to me on March 5, 2008. Back then I was fresh out of the Marines, looking for... 
I guess, purpose. Thought I'd left one war zone only to stumble headfirst into another. We got the call in the dead of night. Cryptid sighting in the Cascade Mountains of northern Washington. Remote, rugged, the kind of forest where you get the sense it's watching you back. Locals reported mangled livestock, sightings of something big and shadowy, the usual recipe for a monster hunt. We rolled out in force, a dozen agents armed for bear, with me as the point man. The hiking was tough, dense undergrowth, rain dripping through the ancient canopy. The men were getting twitchy, whispering about Bigfoot and old Native American curses. I kept my doubts to myself. I'd seen the horrors humans were capable of, and oversized apes seemed the lesser threat. Base camp was established in a clearing near the last reported sighting. Night fell hard and cold. They put me on first watch, a lonely post on the perimeter, armed with a rifle and night vision goggles. It's funny what the mind does with hours of darkness and silence broken only by the rustle of unseen critters. You start building monsters out of shadows. Then came the noises. Not the snaps and rustles of woodland creatures, but heavy footfalls moving through the forest and something else. A wet, rasping sound like something catching its breath. I tightened my grip on the rifle, flipping the night vision on. The world went fuzzy green. It was there. Crouched beneath a tangle of upturned tree roots. It was massive, at least nine feet tall even hunched over. Thick, coarse hair covered its body, a slick, glistening mass of dark brown in the night vision. The head, that was the worst. Narrow and elongated, with a muzzle filled with rows of yellowed, predatory teeth. But the eyes, they were pits of darkness, seeming to suck in what little light dared penetrate the forest. It saw me at the same moment I saw it. A roar erupted from that tooth-filled maw, a guttural, rage-filled sound that vibrated through the clearing. The men bolted from their tents, guns raised, the tranquil camp exploding into chaos. Before anyone could fire a shot, the creature charged. It moved like a boulder dislodged from a mountainside, unstoppable, brutally powerful. Smith was the first. The creature snatched him up with one massive hand and smashed him against a tree. The crack of his breaking spine punctuated the screams. We opened fire, a hail of bullets tearing into its thick hide. The creature stumbled, more in surprise than actual pain, and then it was in our midst, a whirlwind of claws and teeth and pure fury. The screams rose higher, a cacophony of terror and pain. Each scream was another life cut brutally short, another light extinguished in the darkness. I found myself locked in a desperate struggle with the beast. My rifle was useless up close, so I was down to my field knife against its monstrous claws. Its breath was hot on my face, a stench of rot and something darker, some primal predator instinct unleashed. Then those black eyes fixed on me, and I caught a flicker of something cold and calculating before its jaws clamped onto my arm. Pain exploded. White-hot agony shot from my mangled shoulder down to my fingertips. My world dissolved into a blur of blood and roars. The creature flung me aside like a discarded doll. I hit the ground and then, darkness. I woke to birdsong. Confusing jarring after the nightmare I'd endured. The world swam back into focus, sunlight dappling through leaves, birds chirping cheerfully. Then memory flooded back, a wave of sickening terror. I was alone. The clearing was a scene of carnage. Upturned tents, shattered equipment, and the bodies. So many bodies, twisted and torn in ways no bear could ever manage. My stomach revolted. Smith's shattered form stared up at the empty sky, eyes wide in frozen horror. 
Help was hours away, and I was in no state to move. My arm was a useless, burning mess, and the shock was threatening to swallow me whole. I dragged myself into the cover of dense ferns, knowing I wasn't safe. The creature could return at any moment, drawn back by the scent of blood. The radio crackled reinforcements were coming. They didn't believe me at first, but the mangled scene told its own terrible story. Evac choppers descended, and the familiar routine of the cleanup began. They shipped my ravaged body to a secret facility while the official report blamed a rogue grizzly gone mad. Life changed after that. The shoulders gone, replaced by a titanium prosthetic that sets off every damn metal detector. The nightmares aren't as frequent, but the darkness is a constant companion now. I work a desk job mostly, shuffling cryptid sightings reports that make my skin crawl. Some nights, lying awake in the sterile quiet of my apartment, I imagine going back to that blood-soaked clearing. It wouldn't be for revenge, not really. More like a reckoning. One man, one decent rifle, and a monster to hunt. Maybe then, finally, the shadows would loosen their grip. My name is Harlan Stout, and this happened to me on July 4th, 1993. I was working for a unit nobody knew existed outside a few high-ranking government officials. You see, I track creatures everyone thinks belong in bedtime stories and old myths. We had our base in a remote part of the Appalachian Mountains in West Virginia. It's rugged territory, endless ridges, tangled forests thick with shadows. Perfect for anything wanting to disappear. We weren't ghost hunters or those guys on bad reality TV with EMF readers. We were trained, armed, funded. Our job was to identify, contain, and if necessary, eliminate targets considered a threat. You might think I'm crazy, but we had the reports, the evidence. There's stuff out there the public shouldn't, maybe couldn't, handle. That morning, we got a call. Locals near Summersville Lake reported something, off. Hikers vanishing, strange noises. Standard cryptid fare, but with Independence Day looming and the area packed with tourists, command wanted it handled fast. Three of us flew out, me, Jensen, and Carter. Jensen was a no-nonsense ex-marine. Carter, a zoologist by training. Young, bookish, but he was sharp. As for me? I was the skeptic, but with enough woods time to know you don't dismiss everything you can't explain. Locals pointed us to a patch of woods by the lake's edge. This wasn't some Bigfoot thing. We found a campsite, smashed. Tent ripped, gear scattered. No blood, but the whole scene felt wrong. Like the aftermath of a wild animal, but scaled way the hell up. We split up. Me pushing through the undergrowth, Carter hanging back to document, Jensen up ahead as our spotter. It was sweltering. Humidity hanging in the air, leaves slick underfoot. I stopped. That silence, you know it the kind when the woods hold their breath. Something rustled up in the canopy. Big. We all saw it at once, a dark shape flashing through the branches. Too fast, and damn, it was huge. What the hell was that? Carter gasped, fumbling for his camera. Jensen swore, already unshouldering his rifle. I felt that dread, the animal instinct telling you you're out of your depth. The radio crackled. Jensen's voice, ragged. Movement north of you. It's circling. He was right. Through the trees, flashes of something big, dark, and fast. It was an ape-like, not anything I recognized. Quadrupedal, bulky, 
but with a speed that defied its size. Carter whimpered, his fancy camera forgotten. I drew my sidearm. It felt woefully inadequate. Suddenly a scream. Not human, a high-pitched screech echoing through the trees. We reacted on instinct, plunging toward the sound. It led us out onto a rocky clearing near the lake, and that's when we saw it properly for the first time. It was crouched over something, a body, or what was left of one. Shapeless, torn, the ground around it soaked red. It looked up as we broke cover. There are no words for it, only impressions. Immense size, a hunched bipedal form. Its hide was like knotted leather, thick and mottled. Its head bulbous, with no eyes that I could see, only a wide, gaping maw. Jensen opened fire, bullets pinging harmlessly off its skin. The creature lunged, not at us, but into the trees, vanishing with impossible speed. Carter sobbed, legs giving out. I knelt by the mangled body. It was a tourist, a woman from the campsite, what the thing left behind. One side of her face, gone, just shredded meat and splintered bone. Suddenly, I was cold, colder than I'd ever been. Not from fear, but the terrible certainty sinking in. There were things like this out there, predators we couldn't comprehend. And worse, it knew we were here. The radio buzzed. Jensen's voice, taut with the strain of control. Stout Carter, we need to extract now. I'll... A crash from the tree line cut him off. He swore, then shouting, static and that terrible screeching filling the air. I heard his rifle fire, a few shots, then only the roar of the creature. I grabbed Carter, bodily dragging him away. Move! I don't remember the run back, the radio call for the chopper, the shaking in my hands even hours later. What I do remember is Jensen's silence. His body was never found. They called it an animal attack, bear most likely. Locals whispered about a curse in the hills. Me? I never told anyone the truth. Afterward, I quit the unit. They gave me my severance and a strict reminder to keep my mouth shut. But I don't hunt monsters anymore. Some things, it turns out, I'd rather not believe in. My name is Ezekiel Barnes and this happened to me on February 25th, 2008. Married, two kids, mortgage, the usual middle-class American life. Well, mostly usual. My other job, the one that pays for the house and the minivan, that one isn't exactly advertised on LinkedIn. See, I'm part of a government task force that specializes in, well, let's call them unusual threats. The things that make the news a sanitized mess of bear attacks and unexplained disappearances. You'd scoff if I told you what really stalks those shadows, but you wouldn't be laughing for long. Got called in after a string of killings up in Vermont near the Canadian border. Cold country. Deep woods, the kind of places people underestimate. Locals reported the bodies ripped apart like a wild animal, but way bigger. We flew in, a small team with me, Reynolds and Pierce. Reynolds was ex-military, all business and built like a brick wall. Pierce, the youngest, was our tech expert and resident skeptic. Me? I'm the vet. Been in the field for years, seen enough to know that sometimes, fairy tales have fangs. We tracked the trail for days, found torn-up deer carcasses, and a campsite wrecked like a giant had thrown a tantrum. Tension hung in the air thick as the winter fog. It wasn't long before it all went sideways. We'd split up, me and Pierce on one trail, Reynolds on the higher ground for better sightlines. It was getting dark, 
That strange twilight hour where the woods turn from hushed green to hungry black. Pierce started swearing about his thermal reader going wonky. Then I heard it, a growl so low it rattled in my chest. Not a bear. Something old. Something barreled out of the dusk, a blur of muscle and fury. It slammed into Pierce, knocking him down hard. A blur of teeth, the wet rip of fabric, and a scream that cut through the trees. I fumbled for my rifle, trying to get a clear shot. But the damn thing was fast, monstrously fast. It circled, stalked, always just out of reach, its eyes gleaming in the dark like embers. Reynolds shouted into the comms, something garbled with static. Then a gunshot, another roar, and an ear-splitting shriek. We heard him yell, then silence. The creature turned, its gaze fixing on me. It was wrong. Bulkier than any bear I'd seen, with skin stretched tight over bone. Its head misshapen, a moth full of jagged teeth, like broken glass. I took a breath and fired, shot after shot echoing in the desolate twilight. It snarled, staggered, and seemed to flicker for a moment like a glitching TV screen. Then it lunged, and I scrambled backward, my boot catching on a root. I slammed down, the creature landing on my legs. Its claws sliced down my thigh, searing pain cutting through the adrenaline. I got a shot off point blank, and the world exploded in the stink of burnt fur. The creature shuddered, then was gone vanished into the gloom with a strangled hiss. My leg throbbed like fire. Somehow I hauled myself up, calling for Pierce, Reynolds, hoping to God they'd answer. Nothing. Only the desolate trees and the gathering dark. The woods here whisper secrets older than us, tales of blood and hunger. And as I limped towards the rendezvous, my radio dead and a trail of scarlet dripping behind me, I knew one thing, Reynolds and Pierce, they weren't coming back. They were gone, swallowed by the woods. That night the woods won. And tomorrow, I'd be back to finish the damn job. But some hunts, you never really walk away from those hunts whole. My name's Carter Mason and this happened to me on October 6, 1991. Back then, I was running with a crew nobody outside the government knew existed, the kind of guys called in to clean up messes that don't fit neatly on a police report. We handled the things that slither under the radar of everyday life. See, I've learned there's a whole ecosystem of predators out there, thriving just out of sight. Creatures smart enough to hide, or so damn strange nobody would believe it anyway. That's the job finding, and if necessary, terminating those threats. This particular cleanup took us to a backwards stretch of Appalachia. Locals near the Cherokee National Forest were buzzing about a hunter vanishing. This wasn't some lost hiker the guy was experienced, and then just gone. Not a body, no equipment, nothing. Locals whispered old stories about mountain devils and folks gone missing on those trails since forever. I've learned the locals. Sometimes they know more than they let on. We had me, Thompson, and our biologist, Dr. Evans. Thompson was built like a bulldozer, loud and loved a good fight, figured anything too tough he could shoot his way out of. Evans was small, wiry, the kind of woman you'd underestimate until she started talking about bone density or decomposer fungi. Me? I'm not a hero, but I'm careful and I don't quit, which is why I'm still breathing. We tracked the hunter's last known route, deep into the tangled undergrowth. The forest felt wrong, too quiet, like even the birds knew to stay clear of this spot. Thompson cracked a joke to break the tension, 
something about Evans growing a carnivorous plant big enough to swallow us whole. We all laughed, that little bit too loud, and pushed on. That's when we found it, the cave. Not a proper cave system, just a gash in the hillside, vines thick around the entrance like a shroud. It stank of damp earth and something sharp underneath. Evans took one look, said that smell was wrong, not natural decay. We went in. Flashlights cut through the gloom, revealing a narrow passage sloping down. The walls were slick, and the ground littered with stuff. Bones, mostly. Too small for deer, with weird angles. Evans hunched closer, muttering about teeth marks that weren't from anything she recognized. Suddenly, Thompson hissed, Quiet! We froze. Up ahead, a flicker of movement in the dark. Then, a sound of wet hiss, a rustle of scales against rock. Thing was, whatever made that noise, it was big. Thompson switched on his tack light, beams slicing through the gloom. For one frozen second, it perched there, coiled atop a mound of earth. Not a snake, though reptilian for sure. Thick as a man's torso, with dull iridescent scales and a wedge-shaped head. Its eyes. Lord, those eyes, huge yellow slits that reflected the light. And underneath, a maw wide enough to swallow a whole deer, dripping with saliva. Evan swore under her breath. Never seen anything like this. The creature lunged, speed that defied its size. It knocked Thompson aside, sending his rifle clattering into the dark. Evans yelled, grabbed a flare out of her pack, and lit it. The thing flinched back, hissing at the sudden light. It gave us an opening. We scrambled for cover, me fumbling for my own sidearm. I shouted for Thompson, heard him grunt in the dark, then a wet ripping sound followed by a choke scream that cut off abruptly. Evans tossed the flare at the thing. It flared up, hissing and jerking away from the flame. That bought us precious seconds. This way! Evans yelled, pointing to a side tunnel. We ran, blind in the smoke and stink. Behind us, the creature roared, the sound echoing through the cave. We had to get out, get back up. Suddenly, Evan stumbled, cried out in pain. I dragged her up, saw the blood slick down her boot. Something had snagged her in the dark. Then something slammed into me from the side, knocked me clean off my feet. I hit the ground hard, felt claws rake my arm, searing hot pain. The creature loomed above, its breath a foul gust of rotting meat. My pistol was somewhere in the muck useless. The creature reared up, its maw wide, teeth gleaming in the dim light. And then, a flash, and a blinding explosion of pain. Evans. She'd staggered up, one hand bloody, the other clutching her taser. She slammed it into the creature's flank, electricity crackling and arcing. The thing shrieked, spasmed, and thrashed against the cave wall. Smoke rose from its scales with the stink of burnt hide. That bought us time. Grabbing Evans, I half-dragged, half-carried her further into the tunnel. It was narrow, barely wide enough for both of us, and the ground sloped sickeningly down. The creature raged behind us. The ground shook with each of its frustrated impacts. Rock dust rained down, loosening the ceiling with cracks spreading like spider webs. Then came a roar so loud I felt it in my teeth, and the whole tunnel shuddered violently. A spray of rocks peppered our backs. Something big had caved in, blocking the way out. No, no, no. Evan's voice was raw, on the edge of panic. We were trapped, buried alive with that thing still hunting us in the dark. I fumbled for my flashlight, the weak beam cutting a slice through the gloom. The tunnel stretched ahead, promising nothing but more suffocating darkness. 
We gotta keep moving, I said, pushing her forward. We find another way out. Get topside, radio for help. Her voice cracked. Radio? You think those things you'll wait for backup? After thump dash, she choked, coughed, and pressed on. We stumbled forward. The minutes stretched into eternity, broken only by our ragged breaths and the relentless drip of water. With every twist and turn of the tunnel, hope dimmed like a dying ember. Evans slumped forward suddenly, hand clutched to her side. The wound must have been worse than I thought. We rest. Just a minute, she rasped, leaning against the damp cave wall. I sat beside her, trying to gauge how much time we had before the creature found its way around the collapse. There was a grim tally to do. Thompson gone. Evans hurt and fading fast. My own arm throbbed where the creature clawed me. We were running on fumes and borrowed time. Evans coughed, shivered. Always figured I'd go out in the field, facing some, some monster. Her voice trailed off, then she gave a weak laugh. Not like this. Bleeding out in some hole in the ground like a rat. I couldn't find the words to reassure her or myself. Suddenly, she sat up straighter, eyes widening. The flashlight, did you see that? I flicked the beam back. There, just at the edge of the light, was a sliver of paleness. Not rock smoother. Bone, Evans whispered. A pile of them, nestled into a bend in the tunnel. Deer, maybe bigger. But that wasn't what mattered. Beyond the bones... The passage seemed to widen. Could be another opening, I said, hope reigniting. We scrambled forward, barely daring to breathe as light splayed out ahead of us. It wasn't an exit, just a larger chamber. The stench of decay hung thick here, an open wound in the earth. The floor was slick with something, and littered with more bones. A nest or a feeding ground— in the center, illuminated by a slant of dusty sunlight from some crack above, lay the hunter. What was left of him, anyway? Just a torso and ragged scraps of clothing, the rest, gone. Evan's gag turned away. I stared numb, unable to look away from the raw brutality on display. Part of my brain, the logical part, was already running the analysis— Teeth too big for a bear, or any known predator. Claws that could shred a man like paper. No use pretending any more. There were things in these hills the history books didn't know about. A shadow fell across the remains. We spun, hands fumbling for weapons, then froze. The creature was framed against the light, its massive form blocking the only way out. Evans hissed through gritted teeth. Guess we die here after all. The creature lowered its head, those monstrous yellow eyes fixed on us. We were not prey anymore, but a threat. We had heard it, driven it from its lair. Something shifted in its stance. Not fear, but calculation. This thing was smarter than any animal I'd encountered before. Then it backed away. Not retreating, but clearing a path. The motion was unmistakable. It was offering us a way out. We stared at each other, confusion mingling with the terror. It wants us to leave, Evans whispered, her voice trembling. The creature didn't move, a silent stone sentinel bathed in the cold sunlight. We made our choice. We wouldn't get another chance. Limping, supporting each other, we stumbled past— never taking our eyes off the monster that had spared us. Outside the cave, the forest seemed unnaturally bright, birdsong a jarring chorus. We half stumbled, half crawled up the hillside, away from the shadowed mouth of the cave. We didn't speak until we were well out of sight. We made it back, stumbled into the makeshift base camp looking more like the victims of a war than a field op. 
I lied through my teeth, gave some story about a cave-in. Search and rescue wouldn't find anything out there, just more questions. The aftermath was swift and brutal in a different way. Government suits descended, stripping the site clean. Our reports were sanitized, then buried somewhere deep. Thompson became missing in action. Evans and I reassigned far from Appalachia, with strict orders and a gaggle of NDAs meant to keep us quiet. Some nights, I dream of that cave, of yellow eyes gleaming in the dark. I wake up in a cold sweat, tasting the metallic tang of fear. The government wanted the evidence gone, but they can't erase it from my head. There's a whole world out there, lurking beneath the surface of what we think is real. And after what I saw, what we lost, it's not clear to me which side won that day. My name is Declan Knox, and this happened to me on July 17, 2009. Happily married, mortgage, 2.5 kids, you know, the regular guy thing. At least, that's the cover story. The real job, the one that pays the bills and haunts my dreams? That's different. See, the world believes in Bigfoot and Loch Ness, but the government knows there's more out there. More that needs, taking care of. That's where I come in. They called us in after a string of disappearances in Glacier National Park. Hikers vanishing without a trace, locals whispering about unseen predators and old legends resurfacing. My team was small, just me and Yates. Yates was ex-army, a good man, but about as subtle as a runaway train. We worked better at night, under cover of darkness and whatever plausible deniability the suits could spin up afterwards. July in Montana has that lingering twilight that casts long shadows across the hills. The forest felt restless, like even the trees were holding their breath. We picked up the trail of one of the vanished alone camper. Gear abandoned, tent shredded apart like a wild animal had done it, but no blood. Yates swore under his breath, said this felt wrong, too clean. I followed my gut, took a point off trail, down a gully thick with ferns. Found a cave, well hidden. Stank of old blood and something foul underneath. Yates gave me that look, the one that said I needed a psych eval, then holstered his rifle and followed. Inside, the cave twisted and narrowed. The stench got worse, so bad we had to choke back gags. Yates switched on his helmet-mounted lamp, cut a beam through the dark. The ground crunched under our boots, littered with bones. Too large for deer, I realized, and way too many. Yates swore again, held his light higher. It caught on a pile of shredded clothes, and something half-buried in the shadows— Turned out it was the camper. What was left of him, anyway? Just a ragged mess, and the skull. Lord, the skull, massive, heavy, with teeth like a damn bear trap. Only it wasn't a bear skull. That's when Yates spotted the eyes. Reflecting his light back at us, yellow like a wolf's, but bigger. The thing was low to the ground, sleek and dark its muscles rippling as it crouched back into the deeper shadows. What the hell? Yates breathed. I clicked off my flashlight, whispered for him to do the same. Darkness swallowed us whole. We heard it breathing, a wet rasp, and a low growl that set my teeth on edge. That's no damn mountain lion, Yates muttered. Suddenly he swore in pain, Something slammed into his leg. He lost his footing, the cave echoing with his shouts and the scuffling sound of the creature attacking. Yates! I fired blind into the dark, the gunshot deafening in the confined space. I heard him yell again, then a sickening, wet-ripping sound, 
and a scream abruptly cut short. Then silence. Heavy, suffocating silence broken only by the thud of my own heart, and the dripping of blood, hot down my leg. Damn thing had gotten me too. I fumbled for something, anything. Found Yates's discarded flashlight, snapped it on. The beam cut through the gloom, found a smear of blood, then drag marks, leading deeper into the cave. Yates was gone. I inched forward, gun ready, pain lancing through my leg with every step. I couldn't go back, not alone, not without, not without knowing. Up ahead, the tunnel widened into a bigger chamber. The flashlight picked out movement in the far corner. I tensed, sighted down the barrel of my gun, and then froze. The thing was hunkered over Yates' body, feeding. It was huge, bigger than I thought even in the low light. Thick, powerful legs, long clawed arms, and a muzzle dripping with Yates' blood. Its head, grotesque, vaguely canine, but not like any dog on earth. It raised its head, those yellow eyes fixing on me. I saw the intelligence there, the predatory calculation. This thing, this monster, it wasn't just some rampaging animal. It was hunting. And I was next on the menu. The gun felt like a child's toy against that. But backing down meant death, quick or slow. I raised my weapon, took aim, and squeezed the trigger. The roar of gunfire echoed deafeningly. I emptied the clip, my shots hitting the creature, staggering it back. Thick, dark blood splattered the cave walls. It howled, the sound raw and furious. I reloaded, snapped a fresh mag in. But the creature was already moving fast, too fast. With a lunge, it disappeared back into the shadows. My gun was useless here. The creature knew this cave system better than me, and it knew how to fight in the dark. It was stalking me now, picking its moment. My leg throbbed in agony, and my heart was a drumbeat in my ears. I had to get out, get back up. Suddenly, the cave shook. A low rumble started beneath my feet, building as rocks rained down from the ceiling. A shower of pebbles hit me, stinging my arms. I swore the cave was collapsing. The tunnels were unstable and the gunfire must have finally finished the job. Panic clawed at my gut. There was no fighting this, only running blind. I turned and limped, the injured leg barely holding my weight, swearing a symphony that would make a sailor blush. Behind me, the rumble got louder, and something new, a shriek, the same as the creature. Was the collapse hurting it? Then again, Something that tough, falling rock might just piss it off more. No point dwelling on that. I had to get clear. The cave twisted and turned. Every time I thought I saw a sliver of moonlight ahead, it was just a trick of the eye. Then I stumbled out into a bigger chamber, one that sloped upwards. A crack of light cut across the far wall, weak but blessed. I dragged myself towards it hope fighting back the terror. But I wasn't alone. The creature was there, crouched low by the light. It had been wounded, that much was clear. Blood dripped from gashes across its flanks, and one leg dragged unnaturally. Still, it was between me and escape. It let out a low growl, the sound vibrating through the chamber. There was nowhere to run, nowhere to hide only to fight. I raised the gun, clicked the safety, my hand shaking. Worthless thing, with only a few rounds left, but the only weapon I had. The creature lunged. I swore, and fired blind. One shot, maybe two. It roared in fury. I scrambled backwards, crab-walking, hitting the rock wall. The exit was feet away, but it might as well have been on another planet. I was cornered, out of ammo and out of luck. 
the creature advanced. I couldn't think, only react. I grabbed a loose rock, heavy and rough, and flung it with all the desperation I had left. It hit the creature square in the face. The beast snarled, flinching away from the blow. My moment. I lurched forward, scrambling on hands and knees towards the light. It roared in fury and lunged again, but I was faster, propelled by terror. I slammed shoulder first into the crack in the rock, squeezed through, and tumbled down onto a pile of scree. Pain exploded through my injured leg, stars flashing across my vision. But I was out. I scrambled away, dragging myself down the rough slope. Behind me, the creature was trying to follow, but the opening was too tight. I heard it thrashing, the sound muffled by the rock. It wouldn't be trapped for long. Whatever collapsed the cave was only a temporary setback. I had to move, get as much distance as I could manage. I limped down the mountainside, half falling, half sliding through the undergrowth. The pain was a distant thing, blurred around the edges by adrenaline and the bone-deep fear driving me on. By the time I saw the first flicker of dawn, I was miles away. Collapsed on the edge of a logging road, Barely able to breathe, I managed to raise the radio and choke out the emergency signal. Rescue came, helicopter whooshing overhead as the world started to spin. They hauled me up, buzzing questions I couldn't answer. All I could do was look back at the mountain looming darkly, and pray my warning had been enough. The aftermath was the same mess on a grander scale as always. Medics, the blur of the hospital, then the suits swooping in, all sharp lines and grim faces. Orders, oaths, and the thinly veiled threats that kept people like me silent. The official report was a rock slide, the usual cover-up. That was the government way, deny, clean up, forget. They offered me a desk job, cushy salary, the chance at a safer life. I almost took it, Yates' torn face flashed in my memory, a visceral reminder of the cost of that safety. I packed my bag, took a hardship leave, cashed out my retirement fund, and bought a beat-up old RV. Told the world I was going to find Bigfoot, maybe write a book. They laughed, patted me on the back, happy to see another broken agent fade into obscurity. Only I wasn't disappearing. The world was too big, the shadows too vast. There were more monsters out there, lurking just out of sight, feeding on those who strayed too far off the path. And the world needed fools like me to stand against them, even if we never got the recognition, even if all that waited at the end of the road was a lonely death in the dark. That night, I drove south, towards a sliver of wilderness marked on the map. Just me, a case full of gear, and the open road. Ahead lay a hundred strange towns, a thousand unsolved disappearances, and the endless battle fought under the indifferent stars. Maybe Yates wouldn't have approved, but Yates wasn't there to choose anymore. I checked the rearview mirror. No headlights followed. No men in black suits. Just the empty highway stretching into a darkness I wasn't afraid of anymore. This was my fight now, and damned if I wasn't finally free to fight it on my own terms.